and it's like full fledged. It's just he's he's one hundred percent that guy. Wild at heart. Um, oh, I haven't seen Wild at Heart though, yeah, so I don't know. But yeah, there's one that tends to be very popular on the internet at least, and is ingrained into every millennial's skull to a certain degree. Red Rock West. Ah, oh, yes, I love that film. But that's a good movie though. Unfortunately, today I think that we're going to be talking about the film Bicentennial Man. No? Not Bicentennial. Our our producer is getting out a knife and he's waving it wildly at us. We need to get on topic real quick. Okay. Who Uh, is it? uh, Who are we? We're going to be talking about National Treasure here on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're going to be talking about the 2004 film National Treasure, a movie that is Truly a national treasure. <laughs> oh, you don't say. <laughs> no, um, this movie is like, <laughs> this movie's weird. It's okay. Hold on. Before we jump into this, you need to just come out right away and say, this is your choice. Yes, this and was my pick. Also, because you are hankering for a Nick Cage. Yeah, I, I was, I, I had that itch that only Nick Cage can scratch. Um, right. Although and he won't return my phone calls anymore. <laughs> so. I I decided to. Well, you were paying him, you were paying him good money. You knew he was uh, in debt to the IRS, and you're yeah. like Nick. I I'll got give an you itch twenty that's bucks. Be scratched. Yeah. Uh, no, Mr. Cage. If Neil Gaiman has tagged you in as our sole listener <laughs> this week, I do leave love you. Neil out of this. He's our one listener. I have to mention him. Oh my god. <laughs> I wonder if we can like, just like, <laughs> like a self fulfilling prophecy, just like will this into existence. <laughs> Like somehow he's one like, day Neil came and will actually be our only listener. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. I love um, you, sir. If you are listening, when? How did we? Oh, I'm not even gonna. No, like, we don't ask need to go to deep into lore. that joke. <laughs> but, but uh, yes, <laughs> because it's true. He's our only listener. Yeah, but yeah, back to National Treasure. <laughs> this movie. So when I think of this movie, I think of almost like Bill Nye the Science Guy to a degree, <laughs> okay. where it's a thing that I remember watching growing up and I remember liking, but I also think that a lot of people like it because it's a thing that we watched in school that wasn't like doing work in school. Cause I remember watching this in middle school history when we were learning about America. I remember watching this on the bus ride on our eighth grade trip to DC. Like, eighth grade is pushing it for this. I think no. eighth grade. Yeah. I mean, I mean like you really going to put this on for eighth graders yeah, I think so. Like you're like a little bit old for this if you're in eighth grade. Yeah, I don't know, but they they all loved it because it was something to watch on the thing. And I have to steal the Declaration of Independence. Well, yeah, talk about memes. Yes, and like I think it's because of that because a lot of people have had that similar experience where it's like, qu- like eighteen quotes in educational movie. Yeah, because it has something to do with American history. Would you say it's a like a nostalgic type movie? It's a nostalgic thing. It's yeah. Like, you have good associations with it because it was a day you didn't have to do work in school and you just got to watch a movie and there's good actor and there's some good acting in it and this is what whatever it's it's a good time and then yes you you've grown up and even to this day there are still fucking memes on the internet of just like I have to see the Declaration of Independence and Nick Cage himself is almost a living meme at this point oh he is not quite to the point of like Smash Mouth where like you don't need to make music anymore but like you still have a powerful Twitter account because you're just a living <laughs> or meme. like Rick Astley. Yeah. You're or just a living meme. around with all these young fans. <laughs> Rick Astley. I Rick Astley say looks miserable when any, like any, no, he looks great. He looks exactly the same. No, but like he did a cover of, uh, never going to give you up. I think oh. Weezer re- recently. And it, it was just like, the man looks sad. <laughs> He's just like, Oh man. Smash Mouth doesn't care. They're like, we're Smash Mouth. <laughs> Is that like, National Treasure 3, he has to, like, reinterpret Rick Astley and Smash Mouth songs. I think Rick Astley is British. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, anyway. <laughs> National Treasure 3 would have something to do with the Civil War or some shit. Um, oh, no. And they just go straight to aliens. <laughs> exactly. Not even debate. Not even debatable. But, yeah. So, well, here's the real question. So, you feel like people online think of this movie on nostalgic terms. Obviously there's like a meme yeah. culture around it. There's an ironic of enjoyment of yeah, it. Nicholas Cage. But like, is that despite the, like, do you think the movie actually has like merit in that capacity or is it just like not that good? Um, 
I think a good way to describe this movie is stupid. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I don't mean that like this movie is bad, but I think it's dumb. Uh, Right. (laughs) This movie has like the pretension of being like almost an Indiana Jones type, like historical knowledge, like Like barely. Yeah. Yeah. Like not even globe trotting, but like, Eastern America trotting well, the adventure. Um, it's there's some American exep- exceptionalism maybe in this movie. Yeah, so America might as well be the whole globe. Yes, and <laughs> you, you like you want, and it wants to be like, oh, this we're really in love with history and we want to do this. But at the same time, one, it doesn't give a fuck about the history. But at the right. same time, it's trying to deify and glorify American history and make it something grand and spectacular and mystical that goes back thousands of years, even though we've only been here for a couple hundred. Don't worry about it. But no, we have ties to the old West. We we are the true successors of this. Of pal- King Solomon. Of King yeah. Solomon. We are literally the culmination of yeah, thousands of years of gathering of all this thing. And we're going to be able to one to set it three with the power of our founding fathers. And me just re-examining that. I'm like, wow, this movie at best is stupid at worst is just like because this movie came out 2004 yeah this movie is like patriot act era just american exceptionalist propaganda yeah and it gets really kind of cringy at points because of it that. does get cringy but also nicholas cage even though this is like i would say this is one of those most subdued performances he's in his, very stoic in this yeah. yeah and i don't know if he's trying to do like the indiana jones like I'm too badass for any of this, but like it doesn't come off across as that. Right. And like this was produced by Disney. So yes. And Jerry Bruckheimer around so. the same time as pirates of the Caribbean. I think this was literally his next movie. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel like you mentioned Johnny Depp before. I feel like if you're going to cast Nick cage, like you would want to have him be almost like a Jack Sparrow type thing where you like, you have him be goofy and wacky and do right. weird things. But like, well, I have some ideas about that. Okay. That we can talk about. During you go the on with your experience. With well, I, I have to agree with a lot that you've said. It is, uh, I think it's a movie that I watched a lot as a kid because there's some like fun stuff in it, even yeah. though it is stupid. I think the premise is fun. Like the idea that you have to steal the declaration of independence because it, there's like a treasure map. Yeah. It's kind of fun. It's stupid, <laughs> but it's fun. And, uh, I, I watched it a lot for that reason and also because I just didn't have a sense of taste Yeah, when I was that lo- young. Nobody, you don't need to... I liked the Adam Sandler movie Click when I was I'm young. Just, like, I'm just saying that I'm, I'm trying to characterize my experience with it okay. growing up and compared to how I think about it now, which is like, I think not only is it a movie that it plays like a propaganda movie a lot... I think it is, uh, I think it's just not very compelling a lot of the time. I feel like a lot of the, just the the technical stuff of how they structure certain scenes is like, this is just not interesting. This is just like boring in certain moments. I completely agree. Um, however, the weird fanatical devotion to this idea of like American paraphernalia, history paraphernalia makes it like kind of (laughs) interesting in like a other bizarre way. Um, It's still kind of cringy at certain points. And also I think something we're going to talk a lot about are like just the political implications of what happens when you make a movie that plays like propaganda like this and how that kind of works in a weird way. It's almost like an abstraction of a propaganda movie because it's like rationalizing the entirety of like U S like imperialism and all this stuff by creating like a secret conspiracy yeah. for it. So it's this weird like explanation and rationalization of it. Um, but so that makes it interesting too. I, the one thing I do want to say about this movie, despite the fact that I don't think it's like that good really, um, is that there's some like ambiguity that it introduces as well. I think there's a better version of this movie that could be made. And I think maybe there was a more, compelling and more aware of its subtext, uh, like first draft that might've been more comparable to something like a Frank Capra movie, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington where it is in love with the idea of American Americana and like America, but not in love 
it doesn't like fetishize American stuff. It yeah. is in love with the like the concept of America. And uh, I think as far as having that conversation goes, one of the things we mentioned during the prep screening was like comparing two similar but kind of very different in their implication like ideas, which is the, you know, the Donald Trump campaign slogan, make America great again, right? Vapid, stupid, nostalgic. Yes. Um, and then comparing that to a Langston Hughes poem, which is very famous, very well known, which is let America be America, right? Is, is the poem. So, or is it let America be America again? It's either one of those. Point very famous is, poem. Everybody knows it. I mean, I haven't read it in a while. <laughs> but point is with Langston Hughes in that poem is that he's talking about like the promise of America and what it is. And Donald Trump is just talking about this stagnant image of, I don't know, the past. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just a, appealing to the basest emotions and nostalgia of the crowd he's pandering to. Whereas when Langston Hughes writes that poem, it's like a chant. It's like a challenge to you. It is like, let it be what it is supposed to be let as live outlined. Live up to the promise of America rather than... Of the documents that you signed, of this Declaration of Independence. You said that... All men were created equal, but you didn't follow through on that. So let it let this country rise to the challenge and the promise of doing that. Uh, make everybody equal, you know, something like that. Uh, and and that poem is obviously you know interesting and sophisticated in its own right. So we're not going to like do an analysis of it here. But I think that's like an interesting like I don't know dichotomy to play with between those two things that on the surface might appear very similar, but when you really think about it, one is way more profound and, you know, progressive yeah. compared to the other one that's more conservative and, like, um, oppressive towards everyone else and imperialist and exceptionalist. And I feel like I'm kind of disappointed is the point in bringing all this up because I feel like you could do a more interesting move, version of this movie that engages with those ideas. You know, in a Mr. Smith Goes to Washington way where it's like we really need to evaluate the way this country is being run and what it means to engage with our own past. I mean, I have one response to that one word, which is, oh, because this is made by Disney, so we're not going to have any <laughs> complex ideas in there. We're going to make a movie for kids that make them feel good about the country they grew up in. It's magical and amazing, and you should be happy to be an American. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the story of the script or anything about it, but like, it definitely could be the victim of Disney just sanding off the edges of something that's more interesting. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, one thing that we'll or talk about... just hiring somebody to make a completely, like, yeah, <laughs> edgeless movie. Yeah, script doctoring, right? Yeah. It feels like that's why when we talk about there being ambiguities that might, that, cr like, create tension in when it sets up this propaganda, that stuff is not without ambiguity in this movie. It sort of has moments where it seems to be like it's about to be challenged or, like, recognize that there's a problem with thinking that way, and then it just doesn't really culminate in anything because it's like, wait, did you just, like take out scenes from the original draft or did you change them weirdly? Like, so it seems like there's a different did, movie hiding in it. Or did like the writer have ideas that he wanted to develop, but Disney's like, Nope, this is good. Bye. I think this was, I think the first draft of this was by a woman. I should look that up and we'll have to confirm by well, the, when yeah. we start the commentary, but I think it was. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, that's something that I really picked up on this time is that there's like a hidden movie in this one, maybe much like, you know, a hidden map on the back of a declaration or something or like a hidden Tarbosaurus skull that Nicolas Cage has another <laughs> one of his 12 homes. He did get that one though. Didn't did no, he? he did. He outbid Leonardo DiCaprio for it. Yeah, he but had, he had to get had, seized by the government. He had to give it back. Yeah. Okay. So he doesn't was, have it. He had it though. Okay. He bought it for, I believe like, was it stolen by Sean Bean? <laughs> <laughs> no, Sean Bean funded it though. Can we talk about it? I'm just going to bring this up because I think that like, that's the level of stupid this movie's operating on. Okay. That we need like the British villain because America fought England. Do oh, you remember? God. It so, has to like restage the yeah. revolution for some reason. And it's like, it's the English, the English are going to get it. Also like that, that whole thing sets up structural issues that I'll get into. <laughs> Save it with <laughs> later about how like nothing in the movie matters and none of the stakes matter at all, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll get to that later. Yeah, but, why did you choose this? Nick Cage. Nick Cage, buddy. Yeah, I guess so. Got that itch. <laughs> Only he can scratch. All right, well, I'm not going to ask if you're ready to scratch that itch. 
but I'll get on the phone with Nick Cage. I know he won't return my calls anymore. <laughs> Are you ready to begin the movie? I can't think of a good Nick Cage catchphrase, so let's go steal the Declaration of Independence. All right, let's do it. Has it started? Oh, there it is. Oh, there's... there's. It took a long time for us to see that accursed logo. Mm-hmm. Walt backwards, Disney. Um... <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm not like too dis, I'm not like annoyed with you, but you really chose a Disney movie. Yeah. I didn't even remember this was a Disney film. I I think we've done one Disney movie already. Did we? I can't remember what it is, but it's like an off the wall, bizarre Disney movie. (laughs) I'd like, no, I would never make you watch that. But I remember growing up the one Disney movie that my sister and I loved more than anything was the black cauldron, the movie that nobody (laughs) remembers. That one might be more interesting to do as a Disney movie. But anyway, the movie has started. Here we are with a boy who I'm sure would grow up to look nothing like (laughs) nothing like Nick Cage. We're gonna find that kid and he's gonna his job now is a Nick Cage impersonator. That's that's what he is. That's a sad job. (laughs) That's a wonderful job. (laughs) But it's an exhausting job. You gotta spend all your money on shit. No, but nobody in this family right off the bat looks like each other and nobody looks like they were related. That's okay though. I like the Christopher Plummer, uh, granddad reveal. I think he's a good granddad character. He is. Gonna just, he looks like nothing like Nicholas Cage's father. No, he does not, but he has presence. Cause he's like, he's Christopher Plummer. And, yeah. You know, he's very good for the narration of the epic backstory of this movie. So why not? He seems like somebody who's an expert. Yes. On things. But I, yes, I think the Gates is family curse. In addition to having to try to find this treasure is that their wives all cheat on them, which is why none of them look. <laughs> That's why there's no women yeah. ever. Well, OK, let's start there. The Gates family curse. Yeah. One thing, probably the best way to begin this commentary track is to just go over why this movie plays like propaganda for anybody who really is like not feeling that. So w- what's the first thing that sticks out to us? Is it the fact that? of what it's about and just being obsessed with American history or more specifically, it's like obsessed with a specific cultural heritage of America that is like a legal heritage that relates to the idea of being a country that is, um, Westward expanding imperialist, uh, racist. Well, yeah, we have, he's going to talk to Andrew Jackson of all people. The- yeah. <laughs> But the way this movie begins, he's entering the attic, right? Yeah. He's creeping up to find the weird, hidden, you know, uh, antique object that's going to tell him the story of what happened. And uh, that there's a hidden treasure at the end of all these clues, right? And it's like, oh, by the way, that's a subtle fade. <sighs> that's an obnoxious fade, is what that <laughs> is. You literally have the eye over the broken part of the pyramid. Right. But we have this, which is what I was talking about in the intro, where like we have this treasure, and it's gathered by all of the great civilizations, with the notable exception of Egypt, all of them decidedly Western civilizations. Well, okay, you say Western, but I'm saying I think it's more like being consu- – it's like the whole white Jesus idea. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like they people always reinvent – whether whatever government it is, people will reinvent their own history in so many different ways. Like you look at like uh, like what was it with the uh, Romanovs or whatever the Romanovs, yes. yeah, with their flag and how it references Rome, right? Yeah. But then also you have like the Habsburgs Empire did the same shit, yes. and then but also like Rome themselves had to do it with Aeneas in the Aeneid. They're like, oh, we're not just Italians; we're Italians that come from Troy, <laughs> like. It's like, oh, God, everyone has to create their own mythology for themselves. Yes, but this d- directly ties America to, like, every great Western empire is what I'm saying. Like, yes. We're the culmination of it because it's like, oh, we get Egypt, we get Rome, we get <laughs> the Knights Templar during the Crusades. Hard cut to the American Revolution. Yeah, we are the, the like, linear um, endpoint or at least current endpoint of, yes. like, you know, Eurocentric view of civilization. Yes. But the, the real problem with all of this, it's like you can have a movie that's like 
you know, really interested in the history of all that. The thing that makes this movie bizarre and why it plays like propaganda is because it, at the same time, to- it, it, it totally buys into that mythology of like American ex- exceptionalism. And in doing so, it necessarily must repress and not acknowledge the fact that it's built on the back of slavery. Like yes. the fact that it's built on the back of genocide, the fact that it's built on the back of stealing land from everyone. The fact that it was a decision made by a bunch of fucking rich white men who essentially didn't want to pay taxes anymore. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the only reference they make in this entire movie of them taking land from anybody else is an offhand reference to the fact that New York was originally uh, owned by the Dutch and England came and kicked them yeah, out of there. Not even, <laughs> they're literally on Manhattan. Yeah. And they don't even address why it's called Manhattan. No. And they're like, oh, we took it from the Dutch. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, so it, it, you're absolutely correct when you say that. And it, it plays out there's other ways of it expressing itself even in just this opening scene. This scene is like super cringy in that regard. Maybe the most cringy of the entire movie, actually. The knighting one? Yeah, the childish, like in infantile, like the infant, like um, fantasy that also, it creates. his name is Benjamin Franklin. His Gates. name is literally Benjamin Franklin. And also he is like, it's like a seventh son of a seventh son thing. Yeah. His great grandfather or grandfather or whatever was the guy who talked to this random fucking white dude <laughs> who had to talk to genocidal maniac Andrew Jackson. But then you have like the symbolic cut where the guy tells him the secret lies with Charlotte. And then it cuts back as if he's speaking directly to child Nick Cage. And it's like, wait a second. So this movie is like, this is his destiny. Yeah. Also, the Gates family have been trying to solve this riddle for generations, and he's literally the only one who has solved the first step. And they suck at it. They suck at it. They suck. And it's not like they haven't been trying. It's like this is a closely guarded family secret, but they're like, we'll solve this when the time is right. The father mentions that they've been trying to solve it for generations, and it's ruined their lives. Yeah. But it's like a curse. <laughs> yeah. And that's the real thing is that the reason why this movie is definitely like propaganda and plays with those tropes is that it treats this cultural heritage, which again, like we've said, is totally, totally like a mythologized image of America created for a, like deliberately political reasons yeah. in the first place. It's like it buys into that with like religious fanatical emotions, right? Uh, his entire identity is invested. His name is literally Benjamin Franklin. Um, his entire personhood is invested in this mythology. So that's what we really discuss when we say that it's like propaganda. And it gets more interesting from there in terms of how it it sort of behaves that way. Um, Just that little scene and the stuff we're going to get on the boat. Just a quick aside. I'm kind of sad Sean Bean had been this, the villain in this movie. Because I would have liked to see him act alongside Nick Cage for the majority of the film. But he's just wasted. They seem, There's nothing about that character that's interesting. I know, but they bounce off each other real well in the couple of scenes where they're friendly to each other. So I'm like, I would have seen that. Rather than this character, Riley, who we're introduced to, and right here he's saying a bunch of smart science stuff, so you know he is smart science man. But also, for the majority of the movie, they treat him like a fucking idiot. Yeah. Because he doesn't know obscure American history facts even though he's the one who can hack into the fucking, like... <laughs> he he is the one responsible for getting the declaration. Yeah. Nick, C- Nick yeah. Cage just acted awkward and picked it up, like, <laughs> without him, like, the security would have it just tackled Nick st- Cage immediately. It made a stupid joke about treason yeah. to people. Um, and then got caught trying to steal a souvenir. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, that's really the weird... Th- I mean, he feels the most like the, an invented character from like some weird second draft. If we're going with this imaginary backstory that there was a first draft of this movie that was more interesting. Yeah. Uh, Riley, that Justin Bartha, his character is, seems like the most like they just fucking threw him in there. Or like he was originally supposed to be more competent, but like they figured the audience is a bunch of fucking drooling morons. So whenever they make any reference to history, they have to have Riley be like, What? and then they can explain. I mean, that's why I feel like he's thrown in is like, we have to have somebody who doesn't understand basic stuff about American history. And yeah, there's like slightly more obscure things in here, but like 
a lot of this isn't stuff you wouldn't know if you like went to elementary school in the United States. Right. And shit like this, is this boat real? Yeah. I mean, no. <laughs> so like, what does it matter? None of this is real. And the mythology you're playing with in the first place isn't real. Cause it was, it's political propaganda in the first place, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's this weird, you know, fabricated history of the U S that treats the founding fathers as like these, you know, it, it deifies them. Yeah. And then it, it's like this very inherently conservative rhetoric. So, um, that's definitely why it, it plays as propaganda. And, uh, I think the other thing to really go through here that we're going to be discussing a lot is like the idea of what it means for there to be a fetishized object and what we mean when we say that, because this movie is full of them and how that plays a role in this being sort of like a propaganda movie. So like the idea of a fetishized object is not necessarily in a sexual sense, although definitely I think. (laughs) Yes. We'll get into that. I think Nick Cage wants to, to fuck him some founding fathers. Well, I think both him and our female lead want to fuck the Declaration of Independence. They want to fuck Parkington Lane. Yeah. That's who they want to fuck. It's, it's. <laughs> but yeah, no, anyway, there's, there's, I don't know why you brought up that up, but well, they, they there, are there's sexual- a weird, yeah, there's a weird sexuality thing going on too. We could get to that later, but yeah. in terms of discussing what, what it means when we talk about like fetishized objects, Uh, We mean it more in like a cultural way, um, a semi-Marxist way. The idea that objects have certain use value, right? But then when people create like a um, a semi-religious fetishized mysticism about these objects, you are fetishizing them because you're creating this mystical value that exceeds the use value. Yeah. And it just makes the thing like something that you put in a museum. Right. And that's not like uniformly true of 100% of pieces of things that are in museums. Right. But that's sort of the general idea in terms of how it works in this movie. And the interesting thing about this movie is that it takes these like fetishized objects of like U S history paraphernalia that otherwise are just kind of sitting there as like monuments or iconography And then the movie creates this fantasy conspiracy backstory that restores use value to them. It's, it's the, yeah, the the declaration of independence and the Liberty bell and all of these like icons, they're not just amazing because they're historically significant to the United States. No, they have mystical, magical properties to them that lead you to this amazing treasure. That you can only perceive if you're some sort of weird maniac who is a conspiracy theorist. No, uh, a true patriot. I oh, mean. I'm sorry. The yeah. chosen one. Yes. He is the chosen one. Basically. Yeah, yeah, his entire family. This is his family's destiny is to do this. I just, I, I totally did not remember until watching it again this week that his name is literally Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and that's just like so, I just can't believe. There is something later where... Although this movie references a lot of the founding fathers, the two it only really dwells on two, which is Thomas Jefferson and Them Benjamin the most. Franklin. Yeah, and there's a weird thing that goes on in this movie between like the way in which they need to perceive things. There's a lot of Benjamin Franklin, yes, being the guy who like, oh God, is well, this a reference to the thing? I have to interrupt myself. <laughs> yes, obviously, because they're wearing parkas and somebody's stabbing their thumb. I mean, I just I have to be honest. That's like a pet peeve of mine in movies. What? When people cut their hands, it's like, you do not need to do that. (laughs) And also that's going to be a huge fucking problem. You didn't just like do a little Nick or something. You just totally like cut up your fucking hand and now you got to go to a hospital. It was like, I I know you never like had a weeaboo phase, but when I was growing (laughs) up and loved Naruto, there's like certain ninja things you had to do. You had to like do a little blood sacrifice all the time. So in the show, they would just like bite their thumb that works so much better. But no, but like, do you know how much fucking force you do have to break your skin just by biting your thumb open? You know what? I take that back. That's stupid. <laughs> it is <Yeah>. stupid. <laughs> they just do it casually. Just like, boop. Okay. I'm that bo- might be worse because it's not even a clean cut. Yeah. Yeah. Just bite open your thumb. It's I fun. mean, it'd be awkward, but the ble- best place to do it would just be like to like cut your, I don't know, like your forehead a little bit. 
Because it's just like bleed like a motherfucker. Also, Naruto, they have ninja knives, so they have no excuse. They could have just been like, Foop. okay, cool. Anyway, off my Naruto rant, back yeah. onto my national treasure. Filmmakers, rant. stop doing that. Mm-hmm. Stop making people cut themselves to this absurd degree. <laughs> it worked in the thing. The thing. <laughs> he gets a pass. No one yeah. else does. It, you only get a pass if you make a movie as good as the thing. Yes. Just saying. So you're, you're setting a high standard the, for yourself. Why are we watching this movie? Let's go watch the thing instead. Hmm. Is there some way we can construe this as a remake of the thing? <laughs> well, Nicolas Cage doesn't act like a human, so he's obviously the thing. So, Well, the thing is also a movie that's very much about interpretive acuity, right? Only in that movie, it's about other people and not objects. Whereas this one is mostly obsessed with objects. Um, also, one more thing just about the plot of this movie where I... One thing that I kind of appreciate about it, it doesn't do it really well or do it a lot. Actually, kind of does it a lot. One thing I appreciate about this movie compared to something like Indiana Jones, which we compared it to in the uh, introduction, is that we see him doing kind of acts of archaeology. Yeah. Indiana Jones is not a movie about archaeology. It, that's just the framework. It's an adventure story. It doesn't care about history or yeah. anything. I mean, it, it has like the history stuff there for an aesthetic, right? But this is like when you have riddles, you have to provide concrete answers. Now, the riddle is silly, and I, I feel like the logic he's doing here to get from point A to point B, that <laughs> there's a map on the back of a Declaration of Independence, I kind of don't buy it. But also I appreciate the fact that they're like, we're going to have him work through this in his mind and he's going to use facts from history and information to be like, wow, this we're arriving at a conclusion about this. Yeah. You know, like I don't mind that the movie does do it a lot, but like this, the first time is just like, okay, we're establishing gates. We show his knowledge of American history. We're getting clues to the treasure. That's fine. But then it keeps doing that a lot. I don't have a problem with that. I think as long as his knowledge of history isn't ornamental and it has like a function in the plot, I'm like, well, there you go. But the thing is that it's stupid. Yeah. Is the real problem. Like, again, I don't like, is that like a, like, how did they reverse engineer that riddle? You know, if you really think about it, it's like, why would like. Are you sure he couldn't fucking think it's something else? And, also, <laughs> and we took 30 seconds to go through that. So here's the thing. Point one of why this movie's plot does not work for me. Um, the second point I think is more important. And we'll bring that up as soon as they go to the FBI. Mm-hmm. But um, the first one is, why are the founding fathers leaving clues? They wanted to hide it. That's and, a good question. And there, are, as we see with the head of the FBI, like the agent in charge, there are still Masons. Yeah. So and we're not entirely sure how where, yeah. uh, uh, oh my God, Harvey Keitel would be. Does he yeah. know already yeah. that it's there? I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't seem surprised. Yeah. He doesn't su- seem surprised by much, yeah. even when the, it, the declaration gets stolen in the first place. Yeah. He's just an asshole about it. He's like, today's not a day for, um, <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, do you believe the tip now? Fuck you, man. <laughs> yeah. We also got a tip that Yetis were <laughs> planning to come down from Canada and but also, take North Dakota. That was the third tip we got that day that the Declaration of Independence was going to be stolen. Yeah. <laughs> and they all look like Nick Cage. He's not going to steal the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> right. Cut 20 minutes later. I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence. Well, here's the beginning of, of maybe some of the um, the interesting ambiguities that are present in this, despite the fact that it it is a propaganda movie. Ultimately. Um, I think it could have been something more interesting. And a lot of it has to do with this idea of fighting over the founding document of this country. Right. And we didn't talk about it in the introduction, but I think it's interesting that the, when they're doing in the past, it's 1974 and this movie is 2004. Obviously there's like a nice round number of 30 separating those two years. Yeah. But also if you just look at those two moments in American history, uh, they're kind of tense. <laughs> um, 74, you have Nixon, mm. you know, sort of a little bit of a crisis there politically. And then in 2004, I mean, I was really too young at the time to have a true memory of how grownups were responding to this. But I feel like... I remember. Okay. Do you feel like the wave of patriotism was starting to crest 
oh. and crashed down a little bit in 2004? No, it was at its height. That was like, okay. that was the start of a lot of the wars in the Middle East. It was like the Patriot Act was in full effect. Islamophobia was when still When did the rampant. Patriot Act start, start for real? It was either 2003 or 2004. I can't okay, remember yeah. off the top of my head. This movie has some of that stuff too. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like there must have been people at the time who, the moment it was passed, were like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, no, yeah. there was, yeah. but like... Nationally, the ulti- less so. The ultimate, like, ultra-nationalist fervor that came in the aftermath of 9-11 was even to me as a child was weird. Like, yeah. yeah, I was, I was just too young to, to really grasp it on that level. But also for anyone who doesn't know, uh, we live near New York. Yeah. I grew up with students who lost their parents and I think I just could, I didn't, I didn't understand it the way a lot of people understood it. It was weird. It was a weird thing for I me remember and, and everyone. I, I was a kid. Yeah. I was happy I got let out of school early that day. Same. Yeah. yeah. I remember that. I'm like, they. we were in the room for like 30 minutes by ourselves right yeah. like in the morning and everyone was just like giddy. We we're like, this has never happened before. And uh, I got sent home and my mom was just like, you know, a plane crashed into a building and I was a kid. So I was just like, oh, it was probably an accident. I thought Godzilla was on. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought uh, the 98 Roland Emmerich Godzilla movie was on. Oh, God. And I just plopped on the, on the couch, and then my mom saw me, and she yelled at me to go away to my room. And I was like, what? Am I in trouble? Like, Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, God. Crazy. Oh, that was so such a crazy day. It was um, a crazy time. I remember yeah. during the Iraq war in middle school when the Saddam Hussein was hanged, I saw that video when I was in fucking middle school. It was just everywhere on the internet. It was a weird fucking time to be alive. But, okay. How did we get on this? <laughs> because Ultra okay. Patriot has Okay, yes. So point is, this movie, I think, has two interesting moments when you just look at the place in which it's set, where it's like we are approaching constitutional crisis level, which basically has been continuous for, the, for America, as far as I'm aware, is from the start yeah. of the 21st century on. It's been nonstop. So we're reaching that point. And uh, I think part of this movie's thing where it could have been more interesting is like, okay, we are using this as like a Mr. Smith goes to Washington type adventure to be like in a more figurative sense. We are like really trying to examine, hey, do we have to revisit our founding values of this country? And what does it mean if the way things are going right now and the way this this document currently exists is allowing for this country to exist in this way where it's now becoming an endangerment, you know? Or has it always been an endangerment? (gasps) Has it, has it always been something that's, you know, maybe a little bit suspect in some ways, despite the, the beauty of what was promised? Yeah. Um, okay, so we, they went to the FBI, and the FBI didn't believe them. So I'm going to bring up the critical fault of this movie for me. Okay. So we're about to introduce Lady. Diane Kruger. Yes, who is a lady. Um, She is somebody who also knows stuff about history that Nicolas Cage can fall in love with in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's not the point. The point is, so they're going to go to her and just be like, hey, somebody's going to try to steal the Declaration of Independence. There's an invisible map on it. And she's like, you're crazy, Nicolas Cage. And he's like, yeah, I know. But also I'm acting in this movie. But then they come to the conclusion after she won't help them that they have to steal the Declaration of Independence to save it. They don't. And the fact that they can just be like, oh, when Ian steals it, they're just like, oh, it's this guy. He's here. These are his known associates. This is what he's going <laughs> to do. Then the FBI will be like, oh, okay, you tipped us off before. And at any point where it's just like, oh, Ian's going to get to the treasure. It's just like, Okay, FBI, keep an eye on this guy because he's going to steal treasure that's somewhere. And then he already said he's a criminal. Yeah, bust him for tax evasion. Yeah, like it's fine. Although maybe they wouldn't is the yeah. thing. But but also it would have been way easier if Nick Cage just made a super awkward situation. What if Nick Cage deliberately got caught trying to steal it just so he could get people down there when Ian tries to? Yeah, then he'd be like, you know what, we're all getting arrested today. <laughs> but you know what? Now you're in jail. Good luck stealing it now. I might be in jail too, but this is what I wanted. As we've heard later, Nicholas Cage doesn't want to be in prison. 
Is there a door that doesn't lead to prison? <laughs> yeah, because then he's going to wind up with John Malkovich on an airplane. <laughs> we know how that ends. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one interesting thing about this movie, too. That is, was my uh, second choice for a Nick Cage movie, by the way, was Connor. <laughs> I kept thinking about that watching it this week. is like, he doesn't want to go to prison. But what he really means is he doesn't want to go back to prison. <laughs> but uh, this is the sequel to Connor. <laughs> yeah. Um, he lost his accent. That's why he responds to her accent, because he's so impressed. He's like, oh, I lost my terrible southern accent and cut my hair. But anyway, it's interesting that she is a Rosie the Riveter um, poster in the background. It's I'm. It sticks out to me because it's not from the same generation of like U.S. history paraphernalia that this movie usually like traffics in, you know? Um, but yeah. Anyway, another interesting thing that we skipped over in the first part of this uh, conversation that they're having with Diane Kruger is another example that's really good in this movie of, again, fetishized objects, the campaign buttons, right? And you made a comment during our prep screening. You're like, wait a second, George Washington campaign buttons? Yeah. I didn't, I like, you were like, wait, I didn't think he had a campaign. No, he ran unopposed both terms. Yeah. So the interesting thing about that is the campaign buttons, even then, were excessive and fetishized objects with no use value. Yeah. He was campaigning against no one. <laughs> it was just like, yep, I'm voting for the only guy we can. Isn't that great, everybody? And look at me. <laughs> I did it. In fact, like, the first time that somebody was going to challenge George Washington, he stepped down. Like, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's another interesting thing. And the reason why, um, f- you know, fetishized objects really seem to go hand in hand with propaganda is because they seem to reinforce a lot about the idea of ritual. Again, I think the the connection to stress in terms of describing it as a fetishized object that has excessive value that exceeds use value is the connection to mysticism and religious behavior and yeah. religious thinking. This movie buys into that mythological religious thinking is the real thing. And what that does is it has its own accompanying politics right there's a reason why these these objects are like these objects of par- paraphernalia compared to just like i don't know uh any other document from that time right so if if both of them survived like the declaration of independence is way more valuable than a an inventory from a shop from 1776 yes even though they've been through the same things as they're both as old yeah. and they're both from the same culture but and we have multiple copies of the Declaration of Independence, so why do we need the first one? You know? It has to do a lot with, like, Walter Benjamin and the idea of aura, which I'm going to get into later, too. But I I, I kind of like the scene, despite the fact that I think, you know, uh, Nick Riley. Cage is giving a little bit of a, a little bit of a muted, stoic performance that's yeah. kind of boring. Which is funny, because this is, like, the line coming up is, like, the meme from this movie. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. You need somebody to like not do it in a stoic way. You need somebody to be like arriving at a conclusion internally and yeah. expressing that. You need what they're saying to almost be an afterthought to them realizing they're going to do this and commit to it. And for him, he just doesn't really play the moment. However, I think that's an interesting idea. You know, the idea that, okay, the structure that this thing created is now working against our ability to use it to actually gain access to this, to this, to these resources, right? That's really what this is, right? Is like, okay. What he said, Ian will destroy it if he gets the declaration. What the fuck are you talking about? I mean, that's, that's the other thing is like why this plays more like propaganda is because the bad guys are so without motivation almost, or they're without characterization. Why do you think he's going to destroy it? Because he's British. Yeah, but he's a... They're going to destroy our independence, the Brits. No, he would just hold on to it because that would be one of the most valuable items he has. Yeah. He would just put it in his house in a frame. If the treasure does, like, end up not being real, yeah. then, like, okay... Well, cool. I stole this thing that's super valuable. Yeah, or, like, if the government finds you, you can just be like, hey, listen, don't... <laughs> they discuss it's, it as a bargaining chip. Yeah, later yeah. on. So, you know, that's stupid. <laughs> but anyway, it's... It's interesting to, um, what was I just talking Oh, the idea of aura in the original. But I, I think, I like that scene. The idea that, you know, this document says, okay, you are entitled to live a free life as an equal citizen of the world, right? 
and that is that a that is a natural right. You were born with it, and uh, it's like when the structure that this document creates starts to turn against you, then it is your responsibility to do something about it. And I kind of appreciate the idea in abstract of somebody who is <laughs> this terrible CG. <laughs> We'll talk about this, but, uh, I appreciate the idea and abstract of like the type of character who is so in love with that promise that they are willing to fight for it in that way, you know, and they're going to take this document out of the museum and, uh, this movie gives them a way. It gives them the fantasy that restores its use value, right? We're going to take it out of the box and we're going to put it to work in real life. We're going to cover it in lemon juice and then breathe on it. And then uh, we're going to engage with it and use spectacles on it and read it in a way that people hadn't really been looking at, maybe because, you know, it's sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the, it's, like, it's like recto against verso. Do you know what that means? No, I don't. It's, it's like a term, I can't remember where this term comes from, but it's like a theoretical term where it's like recto is the idea of the front side of a page and then verso is like its opposite and the underside. Right. And it sort of goes between like, you know, the surface level and what's behind it almost. Um, and the idea is like, okay, repressed in this document hidden on the underside is this concept of this treasure map, right? Map to this treasure. And there's two ways to do it, right? There's the way to do it where it's like, okay, this treasure is, is wealth, it's resources, it's symbolic of all these things, but it belongs to the people, right? It's general welfare is what it is. Uh, But then it's being hoarded by this like cabal, this cult basically, and being hidden away. It's literally hidden away under Wall Street, right? All (laughs) this wealth. Oh my God, yeah, that's a little, right? not a little, that's very on the nose. So we have to use this document, right? We have to use our founding document and the things it says about us to be able to go back and claim these resources and send them back to where they rightfully belong. And it's interesting at the end, it's like, it's not just the U S it's the world. We're going to send it all over the world because the treasure is from all over the world. Right? So it's like, we're taking all this wealth, this affluence that is gathered underneath wall street by this cabal, small elite group of people. And we are taking it back for everybody. And we're going to use the same documents that created the system to allow them to do that against them to do it. And I think that's interesting. Yeah. But you have to, you have to focus on doing it in that way. Like, I think again, the thing we talked about in the prep screening is like, if you're going to do that too, you have to keep in mind the ideas of like that Langston Hughes poem, like Langston Hughes is a poet who would talk about America a lot. And again, he seems to be, somebody who admires those ideals a lot in almost like a Walt, uh, Walt uh, Whitman. Yeah. Sort of way, um, where they, they sing about this thing because it's like, this concept is strong, this concept. Right. And, uh, it's almost like the concept is like, is like a destiny for them. Like it has to be, we have to get to this. (laughs) Um, yeah, this photo editing is just terrible. Nicholas Cage insisted on doing all his own stunts, including the photo editing. It's so funny that they just did an insert of him. He's like, just look like you're busy on a computer. Yeah. Huh, huh. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Right. But the point of it is like, this you, is stupid. Oh, was, the fact that he's living in his van. No, no, I believe that for Riley. Um, I'm just talking about the green laser declaration of independence. The green laser is stupid. I think this stuff with the chemical is kind of clever. Because, he, again, he's going to restore use value to this fetishized object that is the campaign button, and now it's going to get him access into the vault. I think that's clever. I think that's a good touch. Although um, It's not getting him access into the vault, though. Yeah, it is. You'll see it later. He's dunking it in that uh, stuff, and then she's oh, going to get right, her hands right. on it. Yeah. Um, I forgot. I thought, like, it seems like an unnecessary step, though, where you can just, like, if he's going to offer her the champagne class anyway... Her fingerprints probably would have been on it already. So, you but could. you still have to get her to cover her hands. Yeah, in that gook or whatever. Um, hopefully, it, it's not like you know, toxic or something. But knowing Nick Cage, he's not interested in this woman right now. So maybe, uh, maybe uh, I don't know. <laughs> Be careful with that stuff. But uh, 
Anyway, though, my whole point in bringing back that Langston Hughes poem is to say that if you want to do the movie in that way where you're really trying to fight for a more progressive vision of America, you can, you can invoke other parts of American cultural heritage. You know, that... <laughs> That that's stupid. this is stupid, yeah. That a guard didn't instantly like fucking shoot him or tase him. Yeah, shooting a green laser at the Declaration of Independence. Quick. Also, does this ha- do they take it in for like examination every time a heat sensor goes off? I don't know. Maybe who knows? Maybe I I don't know. That I say like it, that could just be protocol. Oh, there's that man looking at her ass. Very nice. Um. But yeah, the whole point bringing up that Langston Hughes stuff is to say that if you're going to try to do the movie in that way, it makes way more sense to have a protagonist that is non-white. And even better if they're a female. Yes. The reason being is because you have somebody who you don't want to make them like, you know, the the mouthpiece and like the one representation of whatever community they're a part of right? That is marginalized. But at the same time, you want somebody who can engage with the idea of America personally and is not going to be nostalgic about it in the same way that a white person might be, you know? But would very much appreciate if America finally lived up to the grand ideas that it's been spouting. Let it be America. And the idea of being in love with the promise of America, despite the fact that on a personal level, you would understand that it would come at your expense at a certain point in this history and even now. Um, And that, you know, the promise of America so far has been built on the back of like exploitation, slave labor, racism, genocide. It always comes at someone else's expense. Yeah. Imperialism, the list goes on. So the idea is like, okay, America has never lived up to this thing in its history yet, but maybe this is a point in time where we can change this. And I believe in the promise of it enough that I'm willing to put my faith in that. And I think that's a powerful thing. Um, but you don't get that from Nick Cage, <laughs> you know? And this movie isn't quite focused on that either. It's just too Disney. It's right. too safe for that. It's very safe. There's nothing, like, I don't know. Or even with like, because we talked about briefly before how there's a sort of a, like we're focusing on the Declaration of Independence, the... And he's talking about like how beautiful the language that Thomas Jefferson uses in it is and the promises and what the true meaning behind it. But for the majority of the rest of the movie, we're focused on one founding father, which is Benjamin Franklin. Right. And I think that might have to do with the safe thing, because even though Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, which is like the key plot point of this movie, he's also was a terrible person. Um owned a lot of slaves, raped a lot of them, had children with a lot of them (laughs) and sold them to fund his various endeavors. And I think if you're trying to make a romanticized version of America to mythologize, it's much easier to do it with like Benjamin Franklin, who's like the wacky one of the founding fathers. Like there's a bunch of weird quirky trivia about him and he had a lot of famous quips. And I believe him and Alexander Hamilton were like two of the only founding fathers that didn't own slaves. So it's much right. safer to focus on Benjamin Franklin. Well, not just that. I think it's, I think it's again, maybe if there's a different draft in here, it's like yeah. looking, it's not looking at the founding fathers as this monolithic entity of like deities. It's yeah. like saying, okay, these were people with different values or agendas and that some become primary and dominant in this country. And then others are kind of suppressed and obviously the Benjamin Franklin side, because it's part of the secret cabal, is kind of maybe, you know, uh, suppressed and hidden, right? And uh, certainly they rely on a lot of his objects and everything in order to access the map. He's the one most associated with it. And, uh, yeah. The other interesting part of, like, the way this movie could exist is how blatantly this it's... This is like... <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Oh, the, the awkward joke? It's terrible. Yeah, like what? What's his point? He's just. He should, uh, is he just trying to get out of the social interaction, and he doesn't know how to do it? Yeah, or he's just like, I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence to this lady, <laughs> basically. Or his ego is so big that he's like, I'm gonna tell her what I'm doing, or is he pro- without saying what I'm doing? Or is he proving himself to her? Like, oh, uh, good. Get drunk on champagne when you're about to go steal the Declaration of Independence. 
I just think that it's bizarre because it's Nick Cage, and I think his character is supposed <laughs> She's to charmed be, by that. <laughs> the character is supposed to be antisocial, I think. But it because it's Nick Cage, it's like yeah, but you're antisocial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like I don't understand what's the character or what is just a choice he's making as an actor. But yeah, she was like charmed by that. She's yeah. just like, oh, what a goof. Well, that's the other reason why I feel like it's a hidden movie inside of it. Because I feel like this is maybe something you could compare, again, going back to Frank Capra, almost, well, Frank Capra didn't really do screwball comedies. But um, he made it happen one night, which is a really important romantic comedy movie. But the point is, in a lot of those 30s screwball comedy movies, you have this archetype at play where you have like a man who is sexually not quite matured yet, um, often about to marry a woman who's just not right for him, but he's yeah. a dork is the thing. He's a huge dork. Uh, think Cary Grant from bringing up baby. He's obsessed with dinosaurs and he's got those dinosaur bones that are kind of like the MacGuffin of the movie at first, maybe. And, uh, he's trying to get like the, the grant or whatever from the rich guy to keep studying them and keep the museum open or whatever the hell it is. But the point is they're always socially awkward because of their, you would assume because they are so focused on their area of expertise. And I feel like that's what the original draft of this might've been going for, you know, is that yeah. type of romance? Because again, it works well with like a, an idea of a Frank Capra esque classic studio movie, you know, is to do that. But then you cast Nick Cage. <laughs> that is the thing. Like this isn't like, Nick Cage is like the reason most people remember this movie fondly. And right. Like, but also it doesn't make sense to cast him. Yeah. It's just like, oh, well, he's the biggest name we could get. Like, why? What is, what is he looking at in that elevator? Oh, I'm in an elevator. What yeah. is this? <laughs> it's like, is he playing something that the character knows something about fucking like elevator designs? Oh, did you know that uh, it actually the founding fathers made the elevator? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Like, what the fuck? Is, what is that? <laughs> Also, we didn't get a time before when he brought up Thomas Edison, but like, uh. <laughs> yeah, like what? <laughs> okay. That we need to go back and talk about that scene to begin with, because that kind of breaks the movie logic for me. We talked about this during the prep screening, but the idea that like, okay, that we spend about like three to four minutes maybe of Riley discussing why it's impossible to get access to the declaration of independence. Yeah. Then Nick Cage only spends like one minute discussing how it's going to be done. And even if the plan makes complete sense, it's like I don't emotionally buy it because just in term of just in terms of the amount of like time you spent discussing it, it's like you spent way more time telling me why it's impossible. So it feels like the scale is like weighted in that direction more. And if you only do it for one minute in terms of talking about how you're gonna actually go about doing this, it's like but that just seems rushed. <laughs> like I don't think I buy that. Yeah. What if it wasn't Valley Forge? What if it was just like a random combination of Do you those? feel like uh, if, if it wasn't Valley Forge, it would be like an alarm would go off? Yeah. But he's just, he's too smart, Max. He's too smart. Or at the very least, he knows that like, again, passwords are a very good image of like what fetishization is because it could just be random numbers and letters and that would actually be a lot stronger as a password. But because she also fetishizes U.S. history, she has to make it Valley Forge. There's no reason for it. In fact, it makes it less effective in terms of its use value as a password. And just because she's an archivist doesn't mean that, like, does she get to set the password? <laughs> yeah. Like, she doesn't work there. They had to call her in to be like. You know, the funniest part about this is if you try to break into some sort of extreme government facility thing, the password is not going to be Valley Forge. It's going to yeah. be like. 90 a, decibels, yeah. 90 decimals long or whatever. That 90 changes digits. every day. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you think if you just like go in there with your AP US history, yeah. that you can steal the deck. You're not going to know the password. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's why, like I said, like, yeah, this is like, I like the heist stuff. Honestly, it's fun. It's probably the most fun the movie gets. I wish it was more of the movie. Yeah. Like I was saying, I wish this was like almost like an Ocean's Eleven type thing where like, yeah, the stealing of the Declaration of Independence was the most important part of it. But no, it's just like the first part of it. And then we have yeah. to 
get then we do it more things but none yeah. of it is going to be more exciting than stealing the declaration of independence yeah. so why not just make that more of the movie i mean after all that's have, the yeah, meme. Like, have yeah. the rift grow between them like as they're deciding it because ian's just like no we need to hang on to it it'll be a bargaining chip if the feds come for us and nick cage being like no we need have to- them start to plan it together yeah yeah and then, yeah, they're both trying to steal it the same day with while well, trying to stop the other one from doing it. Something like that. Have it be a bigger epic. Get rid of a lot of the like extra steps yeah. in finding the treasure. If you make it possible for like them to somehow get all that other stuff in there to actually read it properly, you're like, oh, okay, we can now access this hidden meaning inside this or document. Or just like change the order. The pipe leads them to the brick that has the glasses and the glasses has the thing that's like, oh, it's... The- oh, Rosie the Riveter again. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. It's America. They do sell those and they are like around $35 in like <laughs> DC gift shops. But yeah, so uh, what else is interesting about this is like... There's another way to take this movie too, where I think this is closer to where it ends up actually in like actuality, where it's like, okay, the the subtext about trying to reclaim this lost wealth that was like fleeced out of the world by these yeah. rich people, um, and then hidden beneath Wall Street. Uh so trying to do that in a way that's like self-aware and progressive, not in the cards for this movie. But as it stands, do you have those ambiguities where it just sort of points out that like okay, wait a second, so this wealth was acquired at the expense of other countries, I assume? Yeah. Because when you tie in America with that history of, like, the Crusades and shit, it's like, yeah, but the Crusades were awful. <laughs> but but the Knights Templar, they were... they were, And were, they stole money and everything. But they were great holy knights, even though, weren't those the ones that, like, were accused of worshipping the demon Baphomet <laughs> or whatever? Oh, who fucking knows? Yeah. What? I don't know. I think that was just like... The Only Cat- on Friday nights. That was the Catholic Church being like, oh, they didn't commit these atrocities in our name. Uh, they worship a demon. Yeah, fine. Bye. That was after they fucking sacked Constantinople. Though. Um, Istanbul was Constantinople. No, it's Istanbul. <laughs> Sorry. What? You never heard that song? Sacked there? Constantinople. No, that, that was a thing. In the Crusades? On. No, that was after the Crusades. Yeah, that was after. That was when a crusade got off to a slow start and they ran out of money. So it was a long story. We don't need to talk about the, I am confused about what we're talking about. The fourth crusade, it was dumb and stupid and ended with them sacking Constantinople. But, um, (laughs) Oh God, they stole the declaration of independence. Fuck. Call the FBI. I, I am interested though. How much, effort do you think the government would get back into stealing the declaration of independence what do you mean like would it be like on the news would it be like threat level one or would they like try to cover it up and just be like oh that's annoying goddamn i mean i don't know they would probably try to cover it up at first maybe it depends on the administration you're in or what time it is uh it would definitely make the news but you know what the funniest part about all of this is what if you tried to report to the FBI that someone was going to steal the Declaration of Independence after this movie? <laughs> this movie makes it much more challenging if you were actually in this guy's situation to try to report it. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's a joke. Not, not that it would ever happen, because why? And also, why does yeah. Nicholas Cage care about this lady? Well, because he's, he's a good person at heart, Max. I know, but like... Also, he could feel responsible that he put her in danger by giving her the fake one. Well, she put herself in danger by demanding the fake one. Yeah, but he got it specifically for the... Stop, nit- stop nitpicking. <laughs> you know, because she's the love interest. I know. Just shut up. <laughs> Just shut up, Max. <laughs> You know exactly how this movie wants you to feel, so just let yes, it Yes, but I don't be. buy that Nicolas Cage is capable of bonding with humans. <laughs> I don't, like... Riley apparently lives in his van. Nicolas Cage is, like, is apparently his best friend. He doesn't even offer to let him crash on his couch. <laughs> yeah, isn't it awful that they're shooting up this van and they're literally destroying his house? Don't worry, he gets a nicer house because he owns a Ferrari. A nicer but smaller house. Yeah. Well, we were speculating that maybe he just like has a garage attached to his van now. <laughs> no, he he just he rents out like a parking space, some two parking spaces, and he yeah. lives in the van. But then he has the garage attachment <laughs> for his, his Ferrari. Ferrari. Yeah, yeah. He did, it's much cheaper than rent in DC. 
Actually, and then probably just, not. DC is actually probably cheaper to live in than paying for parking in DC. Then he just showers in that glowing goo shit that Nick Cage makes. <laughs> yes. So everybody knows where he's been. Next time he does like he raids a tomb, he glows in the dark. Yeah, it's really useful. That actually happens in a Book of Secrets. Um, what? The, the sequel to this, the National Treasure Book of Secrets, that happens. Yeah. Are you fucking with me? No, he, he glows in the dark. Okay, shut up. Uh, <laughs> now you know how it feels. No, I I have never seen Book of Secrets. Uh, I think you said you have, but you can't remember it. I feel like that one's more racist. <laughs> or it's like more like aggravating. I just remember like... Well, there's uh, a book that like the president has or whatever. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's that's the plot of it. Well, yeah, obviously, Max. Okay, the I don't... Book of Secrets. I'm sorry. Maybe it was a book the founding fathers The fact made. that it's a book isn't the secret... It's the secret. Tells you nothing about it. All I remember is that there's Mount Rushmore. Dun, dun, dun. But yeah. So again, the other weird thing about this movie that I was starting to say again was that uh, it's sort of like it has that tension in there where it's like all this shit came at the expense of other countries and it was, you know, rich people. Are you hungry? That seems like an improvised Nick Cage line. I mean, that's the weirdness yeah. that comes out sometimes it is it, when he's interacting with people. Sometimes you see a little bit Nick Cage weirdness, but only in a few moments. It's kind of yeah. disappointing. I think it's just moments they didn't cut. And then other times this is supposed to be like playful banter back and forth, but he just seems really condescending because he's playing it as stoic, you know? And it's just like, you just seem like a dick. But yeah, so the other interesting thing is, again, it comes at the expense of all these other countries and they gather in one place beneath Wall Street. And it's almost like the other way to look at it is like, you know, the other cool move you could maybe do with this movie to make it more interesting is to try to look at the idea of like a history of other Americans that are trying to consolidate and hide this wealth. Make the Masons part of the like antagonism. Of yeah. this movie. Don't make it a British person. Why is it a British person? Make it another American. That makes more sense. You have some Americans that are trying to hoard these resources at the expense of everybody else and in a way that is specifically kind of like imperialistic and also... Yeah, have it like... Because yeah. we were talking about the inherent break between the founding fathers and whatnot. Have that because they were different people with different yes. values. Yeah. Have it so like some of the founding fathers like, no, we need to use this treasure to... You can make it the same thing. Uh, okay. Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. You could create a mythology around him right before he died, before he got shot. Yes. The right? real reason Burr shot him was like... Okay. The last day before he died, he yeah. talked to your great, great grandfather yeah. and gave him this, the secret lies with Charlotte. <laughs> right? That would be way better. Yes. And, and Burr killed him because he was siding with the elitist faction of like, no, we need to keep this for, for there us. you go. And yes, Hamilton wanted to give it to the people or whatever. Yeah. But you revise history in that way. And yeah. then you make it because then there's an and awareness. Yes, we are bringing up Hamilton because the musical is popular, but whatever. Like, okay. It's contemporary. Yeah. Well, the, the point is again, Hamilton is a better example of that because also it is, it is playing with that mythology, but again, in a way that is trying to reveal something about, the way this country is structured, yes. you know, and not doing so in a way that's just trying to like suck Sam, the Eagle's penis, you know, like yeah. it's like, <laughs> Hey, don't gang shame me. <laughs> it was one time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, you know what I mean? It's, it's about acknowledging the things that this type of mythologized version of America necessarily must repress and not discuss. And uh, if you made, if you made the fact of this treasure and, and the fact that it was taken less of a magical fantasy sort of thing and more of like still a fantasy but a conspiracy sort of thing that's like, you know, uh, the idea of this cabal hoarding over this wealth, yeah, a little bit more, you can you can do something more interesting with it, I think, and then it it feels like you're actually you know, fulfilling some sort of destiny because you're, you're, you're like reestablishing the order that was promised when the country was, was first created. And then at a certain point you would say like, okay, so this country was created and then immediately we fell into like a dark time, so to speak, you know, yeah. or the wrong people came into control and then, you know, people made progress, but it's still essentially the same thing. 
there's like a promise of an alternate history or alternate future there when you succeed at the end. Whereas with this, what happens is nothing at the end. Like, what is the alternate future that happens now because they succeed? And how do you know you need the silence to good? I guess the the silence thing. In the I mean, that's the thing of all the riddles in this. Yeah. Like, but yeah, like, okay, here's the question that goes back again to why he thinks Ian would destroy it. Like, what, okay, what happens if he doesn't get it? Ian would just have all the wealth for himself. Yeah. But it's not like the world has had this access to this wealth anyway for the past however many, for literally the entire creation of the treasure, it's been, like they said, it's been a secret. So it's like literally no one has been able to appreciate or be aware of literally any of this since the since the first moment these people started hoarding hoarding it under like king solomon's temple or whatever yeah it's not helping anybody and yeah like, until the end of the movie we don't know that nicholas cage intends to like give it to everybody yeah it's like oh the treasure was too great to one for one man well, you just assume that he would because he's the protagonist but it doesn't come out and say it that's not like part of his motivation yeah like the movie's just like nicholas cage is good guy ian is bad guy because bad guy yeah. So part of the thing in ta- bringing this up again is like, okay, what are the consequences if he fails? As far as most of the world is concerned, literally no difference. Yeah. Because they don't even know it happened and has no bearing on their life. Uh, the, uh, and this is the first instance of the Declaration of Independence causing sexual tension. Look at that. No, it's not. We'll go back and talk about that other stuff. But again, just to finish that point, like, Okay, so if you change it so that the Americans are kind of the antagonists and the evil ones and that there is like a cabal of Masons trying to keep it away from people, then it feels more like we have been denied this thing that by right should belong to not only Americans, but other people who are robbed of it all over the world, other cultures, other societies, right, by American imperialism. And then when you're doing that, you are restoring something of like a natural order that was then changed when these founding fathers got their greedy hands on it yeah so that would be more interesting but yeah in going back to the sexual tension thing i know we've discussed that a few times by now but um there's a weird thing that happens in this movie where like in in the way in which people discuss the treasure specifically while talking to nick cage there's like it's like similar language to what you would use to like talking like about male sexual maturity or moments of your life in that mm-hmm. sense. Like, okay, when is, when Christopher Plummer talks to him about the thing, he talks to him about it in a way that's like, it, it goes to like the idea of like it being a cherished secret or whatever. Right. But he also talks about it being like, Oh, you're old enough now. And it's like, kind of like weird in that way where it's like, Oh, you're coming into your own. You're a young man. It's time that you learn about treasures. <laughs> And also the fact of it being a secret that lies with Charlotte. It's like, what does that mean? All I know is that it's a woman's name. It is sexually charged, the entire thing. Yeah, a little bit. And the fact that, uh, like you were saying, the, the Declaration of Independence creates sexual tension between them where none really existed beforehand. But also what's going to happen here when they pull up to John Voight's house is... What does he say? Oh, is she pregnant? Yeah. So again... He's Nicolas Cage. He's like 40. Yeah, well, it's cares? totally confusing, the situation. Because he's too old for this to be a thing where it's like, oh, I got to go to my parents for help because I got a girl pregnant. It's like, but you're like in your 40s. Yeah. What? <laughs> you're not like 19. As it like, maybe the implication is like, it's been that long since they've seen each other. That he doesn't know how old he is? No, but like... That's the first thing is like, oh, that's the problems he was coming to me with me the last time I saw him. Oh, oh, you think he got someone else pregnant? Or no, just like, well, he mentions before is just like, oh, you, you're too loose with your personal life. And yeah. That, but maybe it's just like, that's how he still views him as a stupid teenager. I guess. But in the context of the rest of this movie where they talk about other things in a weirdly sexual way, it's kind of like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. We all get the the wonderful not look like Nicolas Cage at all father. John Voight. Yes. Real father of Angelina Jolie. (laughs) 
which you didn't know until yesterday when I told you. Yeah. I don't really and care. And also, like, not a great actor, I'm mm-hmm. going to say. I kind of just don't appreciate a lot of his acting decisions because I think it's boring as shit. He's just, like, an easy casting choice for so many different roles of a certain type, and he just never... He never seems to, like, do anything interesting. Um, he used to be an interesting actor. He's in Deliverance. <laughs> Stop offending Nicolas Cage and his life partner, <laughs> Riley. Ooh, you let your dad down because you weren't an insane conspiracy theorist, you fuck. How dare you? Are you talking about, uh, what's his face? About John Boyd? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like maybe that's the history of the Gates family. Sons who disappoint their fathers. It was. I just. I don't understand what that means. It means that he disappointed the grandfather because he didn't believe in the conspiracy theories. And I know, but I mean, like, is it though? I. I guess whatever. Again, it just speaks to the idea of this being like a, a multi generational destiny that they all have to fulfill together. That, that's. By that. the way, this moment is actually interesting from John Boyd, though. Because this is the closest the movie actually gets to self-awareness, right? Where it's talking yeah. about like, oh, they invented the myth of this treasure to keep the British occupied searching for money. And it's almost like it, that's the closest it gets to being like a flip side of it, which I was trying to get to earlier, which is like, okay, they invented the myth of the Declaration of the Ind- Independence. I mean, the front side of it yeah. as a myth, just as a front that they could then use while they hoard resources beneath wall street you know (laughs) yeah that's the other dark side of this right yeah we'll get to that when they get to wall street but and uh that's that's where the movie almost comes close to trying to question the value of like you know fetishizing these objects and treating them with all this religious reverence you know, but it doesn't really go anything <laughs> any further than that. And again, it externalizes it by making the the intended audience of that mythology the British. Yeah. <sighs> by the way, speaking of like audiences and uh, you know how people interact with these objects, I get a weird like. Another reason why I feel like this movie ultimately ends up being way more conservative. Um, despite its ambiguities, is that I get a weird, like, Machiavellian, like, Ayn Rand vibe from Nick Cage's character in this, where, like, he's part of the elite few that have the, like, mental acuity and, like, the ability to perceive the real value in these objects. Yeah. And thus he has a right to take them. He's motivated by Ian trying to steal it. But also... When people get in his way, again, he doesn't do the thing like we said where he just puts them both in jail. He's like, well, I'm going to steal it for myself because you're not doing what you need to do and you're not taking my word for it when I tell you this. And uh, because I have the ability to do this, I'm going to, you know? Yeah. There's something weirdly like Ayn Rand-esque about that. And we're about, she's getting the, constitution or the declaration of independence all wet so that they can blow on it together i okay i actually again weird in terms of like the sexual nature of it but also i kind of in a better movie where the romance works better i think that's actually a kind of like interesting economical moment of writing where it's like okay they have to interact with it in this unconventional way that's also kind of like sensuous (sighs) don't do that uh hot but I mean, in terms of like build a building block moment of a romance, it would be more interesting if this movie was better written and there were maybe better fitting actors for this. But like that's that's like an economical moment in terms of like building a romantic rapport, you know, is that they interact with this thing in this bizarre way. But then they it's this weird moment. I kind of don't mind that as much is what I'm saying. <laughs> but also that that. That also goes back to the interesting thing of this movie that could have been, you know, if there was a better version of this, it would have been even more interesting, which is the idea, again, of, like, removing these objects from their context and restoring 
use value and function to them so that they're not merely like totems, mystical totems is like, we're going to get the declaration of independence and we're not going to re you know, reinterpret it by just looking at the writing on it. We're going to put lemon juice on it. We're going to bend it and like fold it and, and, and blow it with like a hairdryer. You know, it's like you, you make the object way more like, I don't know, pliable maybe you have to bring it into your own real life and like touch it with your hands. Right. Yeah. And you're engaging with it in a more tangible way instead of just reading it. And I kind of think that's interesting because it's just like a completely different way of engaging with it than what you would expect from the museum. It's like the exact opposite. Right. So it's like, if you're looking at ideological implications, it kind of works if you're going to do it as like a counter interpretation to try to restore America. Also, I know this is 2004, but couldn't you find like the silence do good letters on the internet? That's the dumbest thing of all of this the, in terms of this moment is like, okay, it's not like the original ones. <laughs> yeah. Where like, it's like, Oh, you need to, there's another thing on the back of them or something like that. No, you right. just need to know letters from them. That's the interesting thing about this is that this movie in how it treats the declaration of independence really restores, um, what again, Walter Benjamin would call the aura of it, yeah. which, which places a lot of emphasis on that being the like authentic document. We like, we see an example of it too. We get the souvenirs that are even more fetishized where, where it's literally, literally just a replica. Right. And, uh, we know that that doesn't work because Ian grabs it and he's like, Oh fuck, this is just a replica. It's not going to work. You need the real one of the declaration of independence. But in terms of how they interact with the silence, do good letters, that's not required. You just need access to a, a reproduction of it. So the aura of it has no meaning. There doesn't matter at all, but then it's going to take up the next however many minutes of this movie. Yeah. But they do need a reason to get to Philadelphia so they can look at the Liberty bell. Yes, because it's Philadelphia. It's the historic city, except it's Philadelphia. <laughs> I love how they just believe this guy. Like, in 2004 era America, they wouldn't just like fucking detain him indefinitely until. <laughs> yeah. This movie has some Patriot Act stuff, but also like Disney version again, they're going to detain your dad, but they're going to be nice to him and they're going to make j jokes to him. No, they're not detaining him because Ian goes and gets him easily later on. Oh, is that what happens? Yeah. Ian kidnaps him. Well, okay then they're just like, Oh, we'll take your word for it that you didn't help out your son. Because you're duct taped with a drink and the remote in your hand, so it's fine. That's literally a trope of like all movies. Yeah. Is like punch me, so it makes it look like I tried to stop you. But they don't know they're in a movie, apparently. So they they don't know that trope. Movies don't exist in this universe. No, o only American history. It's the only form of entertainment. Oh, do you see that word noddles? <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? I thought it was noodles, but noddles maybe too. Why would he be writing about either of those things? <laughs> well, one is an actual thing. It could be a name. Uh, some, somebody noddles. Um, but no, because he was writing under a pseudonym to his brother's newspaper. And I guess what this movie is saying, that like Benjamin Franklin like made the code using like letters from like letters from those letters. Like... Because otherwise it's implying that Benjamin Franklin wrote those letters when he was 15 to contain Honestly, it could be either or. Yes, they're both stupid. I mean, okay, the one that makes more sense, obviously, is that he just, like, turned his own life into, like, paraphernalia for people to interpret. Yeah. And did it that way. Um, which would be super egotistical, by the way. Yeah. To do that. Uh, however, one of my favorite writers did that. <laughs> Um, to an insane degree where people like interpret his like laundry lists. But anyway, like the idea that he is also like a chosen one in like a reincarnation of Benjamin Franklin, who is like the first version of the chosen one. It's like, he's almost leaving clues for himself. Does this make sense? Yeah. Like he is the reincarnation of Benjamin Franklin and he's the only one who can actually communicate with the real Benjamin Franklin. <sighs> yeah. So it's like, maybe part of it too is also that Benjamin Franklin and why would, the real one was like a destiny and chosen would, one. And why would it be in the silence do good letters? Like those are historically significant because like 
It's like, oh, look, young Ben Franklin. Yeah, what are they even fucking about? I've never heard of them except for this movie. They're, it's just like a quirky thing. Like, he pretended to be an old wood, widow and wrote into his brother's magazine advocating for things so he wouldn't get in trouble and his brother wouldn't get in trouble for this. And Yeah, he was basically being a Twitter bot. Yeah, and yeah. they're historically significant because Ben Franklin went on to be historically significant, but they're not the most important thing he ever wrote. You think that like he would put the clue in a, like a book he knew would live on or something right. like that. Well, uh, that's the other interesting way this movie could have treated the declaration of independence that they actually mentioned in the boat scene originally, which is interesting where, um, if you wanted to do this movie in a way that's a little bit more progressive, you would acknowledge again, the idea of fetishization, which they do in that boat scene. And he says, what does he say? What does he say about the declaration? He says, Oh, putting a map on the back of the declaration would have ensured its survival because it's such an important document. Right. So it's almost like you're using the fetishization of this society to ensure that this hidden meaning stays alive. But it's like, is, are the silent do good letters that important? Were they ever that important to anybody? I don't like probably not. No. Why would people try to save that compared to Yeah, he the Declaration of Independence. He didn't know they were going to be saved until after he became an important person. That was yeah. 50 years before the <laughs> Declaration of Independence was written. Those were written 50 years. You're just going to happen to have letters you sent into your I brother's mean, newspaper. I mean, who who knows? There's just too many They're questions. famous because we happen to have them. That's why. Well, anyway, uh, this is an interesting dressing room. Where oh, have- yes, the sexual <laughs> tension dressing room. Yeah. And then she says, people don't really talk that way, you know? And then me as an audience member goes, yes, they do. She likes him. She's doing the toe thing and giving him the eyes, and they just had the sexual tension dressing room. So do they pay for the clothes while they're wearing them? Mm, I Yeah, you can do that. Okay. You can go to stores and walk out with them if you change them in the dressing room. If I saw Dick Cage do that, I'd be suspicious. <laughs> I'd be like, are you a criminal? <laughs> I'd be like, Nicholas Cage. He's like, no, you can't tell it's me. I'm in disguise now. <laughs> My name is Nicholas Coppola. <laughs> Not Nick Cage at all. Somebody uh, pointed out something recently using that example where it's just like, we need to stop. Uh, when you write about transgender people, you can't just be like their name and then like born as this. Like, cause when we write about Nicholas Cage, it's not just like, Oh, Nick Cage born Nicholas Coppola's new movie <laughs> is coming out. It's, it's weird. Oh, what do you mean? The idea of like trans people getting less respect in terms of their name yeah, compared like, to like people with fucking stage names. Yeah. Right. Like we all like Tom Cruise isn't his, his birth name. He changed it to that. Cary Grant, we brought him up. Do you know yeah. his real name? No. Ansel his, real, El- his name is Ansel Elgort. It's worse. Oh, God. His real name is Archibald Leach. <laughs> I love that, though. That sounds like a cartoon character. Yes, it sounds like a cartoon villain, but... Yeah, so Cary Grant... Archibald Reginald Leach. It sounds like one of the, like, you know, goody two-shoes dorks he would play wow i'm thirsty for a good bottle of aquafina water now this movie has a lot of product placement we haven't talked about how they both had the same brand of laptop a lot of product placement yeah hp laptops good laptops though that's what my laptop is yeah we we saw an urban outfitters shot when they walked we also saw like uh the um diaper thing yeah does does the koala care like thing do they have to advertise for their thing i guess so (sighs) that's weird that is weird that they showed that though. I don't know. Maybe Koala Care with big Koala Care money, diaper changing stations. This is moving its pocket. Right. Well, it's interesting. We're just talking about this again too. Is like this movie is so much about like the archaeological work of trying to look at things and then interpret meaning in them. And uh, it's interesting how much money plays a role in that. Again, it's like the type of ambiguity that this movie like creates, but then ultimately doesn't think about at all. There's also, so many scenes of people looking at money. Do we want to point out how like both of them have history degrees and neither of them knew daylight savings time wasn't established until World War One? Again, Riley comes in and fucks up everything because he's just there to be 
a placeholder, right? So he fucks up continuity between characters and everything. It's like, yeah, these two people whose entire lives are built around being pedantic fucks would know about daylight saving. Which is I mean, honestly, like, on the record, I want to go on the record as saying we should abolish daylight savings time because it was invented by Kaiser Wilhelm in the <laughs> during World War I to save uh, fuel in the homeland so you would have more money for the war effort and every other country just adopted it and we've been doing it since. So uh, unless you want to carry on the legacy of Kaiser Wilhelm. Again, it's just talking about all the same shit though is like, what is this ritual that is part of society that is, is it related to an object? Yes or no. Okay. What does it do for real? And why do we call it this thing to try to pretend that it has some sort of mystical importance (laughs) aside from the weird, like deliberate political thing that it's, it's actually accomplishing, you know? Yeah. He did it to save money, much like many things in the American founding documents were done to save money, <laughs> except we have to dress it up in this romantic language to feel good about ourselves for some reason. Why didn't we make one for the bicentennial? Why is there no bicentennial, Bill? Because that would have been, uh, I don't know, 1976. I don't think I'm... Will this country still be here for a tricentennial celebration? No. <laughs> are you asking me for real? Yeah. Are we going to make it to 2076? Uh, I don't think so. Well, every it's... estimate people make about the climate, like the environment, is like way worse than their than their initial estimates. Yeah. I feel like people ha- like can't get a grasp of how much this is going to fuck us over. The only question is how, like, at what point in the next 100. three to four decades? Yeah, we're not going to get to twenty seventy six. Is is my bet? But uh, like, even if like, will there be? Or some people will, but it really won't. Yeah, like, the like, idea of America won't matter. There was anymore. three people living on top of the Adirondack <laughs> Mountains. Yeah, and they're just like, this is the United States of America. I'm the president. <laughs> Oh, maybe I should look in this strangely light brick that I'm holding. Oh, my God. (laughs) It'd be funny if those were like the John Lennon glasses. (laughs) Somebody had just replaced them. Oh, I knew those Brits were in on this, trying to steal them. That's a clue. John Lennon was trying to tell us. Assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Wait a second. No, that's right. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> We're just gonna go all in on this. <laughs> Mark David Chapman was part of the Templar. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to stop John Lennon from explaining. Uh, yeah, John Lennon was about to was about to sp- when he wasn't, speak the truth. When he wasn't busy beating his wife, he was trying <laughs> to explain the secret of national treasure. No, Max, that's why he had to beat his wife. You're doing the propaganda wrong. Yoko, you have to justify Yoko every bad thing. Yoko a Templar too. God yeah. damn it! And he's trying to beat it out of her. Oh, no. Fucking a. Oh, here's a good moment talking about the idea of aura. The last time this was here it was being signed. Doesn't matter, right? But again, yeah. it's the aura of the object that gives it its like religious power. And again, these spectacles, you can compare them. I think an easy comparison, I think, is the uh, glasses and they live. Except, again, they serve different ideological functions. These glasses create depth in this document and create hidden meaning and mystery, which is key to the idea of keeping it like this religious object, right? And what it does is it it reaffirms the status of this object as like something that that you can treat with religious reverence because it now has this hidden use value, right? Whereas the glasses in They Live reveals the fact that nothing has use value. Yes. and Consume, obey. Yes. It it reveals the fact that all the shit just exists to make money for no reason. And is it actually useful? No. And in fact, a lot of it is just there to try to manipulate me in one way or another. Yeah. And this is this is the part where the movie gets boring for me. In what way? It's just we only have re- this that's the last clue they really need. 
Oh, you mean the idea of them going to Wall Street? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the movie just drags on and on. We're going to get the protracted chase sequence. The problem is that by this point in the movie, we have now had enough time where we're like alternating between action chase scene and then archaeology scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. When it starts out and they're competing for the Declaration of Independence, you're like, oh man, they're going to come up with their plan and then Ian's going to come up with his plan and then we're going to see them you know, go back and forth with one another, He's right? They're going to get there first. There's tension, but this is just like they're going to end up at the same place. Like, it's... <sighs> you know that it's going to go towards a climax, yeah. right? And by the time you get the clue, you're just waiting for the characters to actually physically get to that point. You know what I mean? You're like, okay, I know either one of them is going to end up at where that clue tells them to go, which is Wall Street, right? Yeah. And you're like, okay, the only question now is how long will it take for us to get there and who's going to get there first? You know? So what it would have been maybe a little bit more economical to do from a writing standpoint is to try to have their encounter with Ian and his goons be something that impedes their ability to accurately read the clue itself, you know? So then now when they're running, okay. I said it was stupid that Ian was British. If you want to make him British, I would say like play with that a little, maybe like the Brits and the Americans both had different ideas. Like the split, the split thing where like the British people wanted to keep it for the crown, but the Americans wanted to like distribute it amongst the world or something like that. Right. It's simplistic, but it's the level this movie is operating on. Sure. And so like Ian has separate clues that like British people left him. So he's going to different places, but they're all going to end up at the same place eventually. Yeah. And they run into each other at certain places. Again, that's a really neat way you could do this movie. Even if you're doing a smarter version that is operating on a higher level than the one you're describing, which is like, okay, Benjamin Franklin and these other people weren't the only people to even know about this. Maybe you can get other people from like American cultural history who are like able to leave behind clues and their approach to what they think of this treasure is completely different. Yeah. Right. Then the, then the treasure takes on a more significant meaning become, because it becomes this thing of like this promise of what? of like American manifest destiny and everything that comes with that. Yeah. It sounds great. If you approach it from only one perspective. Yes. <sighs> when you see the hidden cost of what that dream is and you see who it comes at the expense of, then it becomes a lot more complicated and the possession of that wealth becomes something that's a lot more problematic. You got to figure out what's going to happen now because this was taken from people. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that would be a more interesting way to do it. And also... That was tension made exclusively in, like, bad editing. Yeah, this movie is not the best with technical stuff. But the interesting thing about your suggestion there is that it actually goes further in also establishing, like, Ian as a more formidable, like, antagonist. And like, I, He's not just, like, a dumb brute. He's also... Someone who I mean, is technically he's more competent than Gates. He's had none of the clues and he's literally followed them every place just based on like the one clue he had in the beginning. Yeah. So. Just through sheer powers of deduction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's not really their intent. You know, I think their intent is more to be that he's <laughs> there's that awful <laughs> stunt, by the way, where if you're not going to watch this movie with us, you, I mean, if you're listening to this, you probably are, but it, you know, if you're not watching it, you have to go right to the time mark of that moment in the movie just to see Nick Cage do his own stunt, and he awkwardly rolls over on the ceiling. <laughs> For no real reason. He just does it like an old man. And it's like, wait, why are you doing that? You didn't have to roll over. I'm going to do my own stunts. Why do you care? Let it fall onto the sidewalk down there. Shoot Nicolas Cage. That's basically what I'm saying. I'm telling these goons to shoot Nicolas Cage. Oh, stupid rich people always getting in the way. Stupid bikers. Oh, no. I was going to say something and I completely forgot. We're talking about The truck didn't even like try to stop? No. Well, you know how cars are in the city. 
It's filled. Uh, they don't move. They don't stop ever. I don't know. Maybe I'm just new, used to New York where it's just like pedestrians don't care and they will literally walk in front of cars and just, if you hit them with a the car, fuck you, you're going to be broke for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because it's New York. But also I feel like a lot of those people that are really insane about it are like, well, you're just, you're like, I don't know if you could like, I don't know if you could sue somebody. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I I, I'm, I don't I'm know just, anybody who would want to willingly drive in the city. No. It's a terrible idea. Oh, yeah. Here's the uh, assassin from Mulholland Drive <laughs> on the right. Who apparently, this is his backstory. He used to work with the FBI. Yes. This movie is in a lot of, it's a very elaborate cinematic universe. It's a sequel to Con Air. It's yeah. both a sequel to Con Air and Wild at Heart. Because okay. Nicolas Cage was in that too, but yeah. also a sequel to Mulholland Drive. A prequel to Mulholland Drive. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. It exists in a weird limbo. Yeah. <laughs> this was, this, uh, what's the director's name? John Turtle? Turtle Taub? Yeah. He's actually a pseudonym for David Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Alan Smithy for David Lynch when yeah. he doesn't feel like doing Alan Smithy. That's the real mystery of this movie. If only this guy wasn't busy making quips at capes, he might have like looked around and saw his two oh, associates. Harvey running tell. Around. Yeah. Yeah. He's just he's incompetent. He doesn't know how to do anything. Why are you so sad? He he doesn't Riley doesn't have personal stakes in this. I don't know. I feel like he's lived in a van for years just as part of doing this. I know he's being paid ostensibly, but like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess Nicolas Cage was his lover for the longest time because they were the only two people they I have. I guess so. But it's a weird homosocial thing going on. Also, can I just say that uh, Harvey Keitel's suspenders are really something. Were those his own suspenders? <laughs> Did somebody in like the wardrobe department pick those out? What is the story behind those? <laughs> like Harvey, I want to like see them. They look like a giant tapestry. Yeah, it's it's definitely weird. It's not what you would expect the wisecracking yet hard ass FBI agent to do. Oh, here's where he's talking about his experience with Con Air. <laughs> yeah, I think this is also a little bit of self awareness from the movie too, where it's like somebody's got to go to prison, <laughs> and it's like this weird again post Patriot Act thing that somebody you, has you know, to be blamed it doesn't necessarily have to be the person who does it but it yeah. has to be somebody again going back to the idea of the government not necessarily being 100 percent the good guys in this and what was avoided by this movie where if you're talking about what like what is the need for him to do this you could have just not made it british people you could have made it americans and then you could have made the the people who are representatives of the system you know the fbi in this situation you could make them either I don't know, not pre prepared to deal with the real antagonists or in cahoots with them in, in a certain extent. But it doesn't do that. However, it does make them uh, something he has to contend with nonetheless. New York. Is it sheer coincidence that Ian says to meet in New York when they have to go to Wall Street. He knows about the glasses, but he doesn't know that it says here at the wall. Or maybe they told him because uh, Riley and Lady. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they want to plan it. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe they said that we do need to go. Oh, wait, no, because he has to tell. Or maybe they just said... We that it's in New York? Yeah, we should go to New York. You need to go to New York. Yeah. Because then he needs to. he says that we need to go inside Trinity Church. Because he recognizes the Celtic cross symbol, I guess. Right. Uh, oh, whatever it is. <laughs> who cares? Here's another There's interesting... so much of this movie I could nitpick apart, but like at this point, I'm just like, who cares? Yeah, I mean, who does care? It's just, it's not, just not compelling. It's not exciting to watch is the real problem. And here's another weird moment if you're going to talk about like the different types of objects in this movie or, or like iconography is like... The Intrepid is not like the rest of the things yeah. you've seen or visited. This is not like, you know, 
an 18th century thing of like American iconography. But it's clearly treated the same because we see similar images show up. We see the kids on tour, right? We see tourists everywhere. That's just New York, though. You can never find a place to yourself. There's always just people walking around no matter what. I do miss the city, though. I need to get back soon. Incoming air traffic. Are you going to fly in on a helicopter? (laughs) Yes. Also, the weird tension of this being a post-9-11 movie with this moment of them in New York and then the unidentified aircraft is like, what? Well, it's an, ala- it's an elaborate thing from Ian of just... It is, but it's like, again, it's like... I- I'm trying to put myself back in the shoes of trying to watch this in like 2004, you know? And like them being in this touristy public place and there's a hidden plot by these people in New York and there's a, there's a helicopter that's coming that they don't know anything about. It's kind of like what? Um, yeah, that's kind of an interesting part of this movie too. If you're going to talk about like Patriot Act stuff. Oh, here we get this quote about Thomas Edison was just the perfect embodiment of this movie's mythology. Thomas Edison was great. Ignore the fact that he needed to hire a Serbian guy named Nikola Tesla to do like literally anything with the kind of electricity he was using. Ignore the fact of almost everything he did. Yeah. But the light not bulb. just with light bulbs, everything. Yeah. Ignore it. And now he's a great mythological American hero. But also like it's just the perfect embodiment of it. Let me ask you something. Is there a, a, like a more obvious platitude in the U.S., do you think, than that stupid quote from Thomas Edison? Is that the most obvious quote and platitude that anybody has ever said in the U.S.? Maybe. I feel like that is so ubiquitous that it's like absurd. Oh, whoa. But at any rate, for people who somehow do not know this, Thomas Edison was... I think everybody knows who Thomas Edison was. Okay. I'm just saying that he was a sham. Yeah. He was a crook. Basically he stole all his ideas for everything. What he was good at was filing patents. Yes. And and getting legal teams to fuck with people. If you're curious, uh, one of the funniest, funniest, one of the most interesting versions of this is like the battle over electricity and specifically marketing and how that works with the idea of the U S developing the electric chair because he was competing with other people, you know, with different types of power. Right. And he's saying like, Oh, this type of power is way more dangerous than mine. So he went on a testimony to do it. Right. And it was all about the electrical chair. Basically the guy was kind of a snake oil salesman. Oh no. The way it goes. The the whole electricity thing was Nikola Tesla was like a, born prodigy genius, especially in the field of electricity. He yeah, made amazing strides in the kind that we use for everything today, which is alternating current. But Edison was busy tra- yeah, championing direct current, which if we had to use today, we would need brick buildings every one mile in order to transmit electricity. So that's fun. But which is part of why he was trying to be like AC all the way for the electric chair. Yes. It's way more but, dangerous. Yeah, so he got... There's also the whole thing with him killing that elephant in that stupid movie he made. He brought... Yeah. He brought Tesla over to the States, and then <laughs> he had him fix some problems they were having with direct current and offered him the modern equivalent of a million dollars to do so, and Tesla fixed it super quickly, and he's like, okay, can I get paid now? And Edison's response was, oh, Tesla, you don't understand our American sense of humor. <laughs> and just like fucking ripped him off. He's an awful person. Yeah. So again, him using that line when it has, in both instances when that line is used, it has no bearing on the conversation being had. The first time he says it when they're talking about like their plans to steal the declaration, it's like... It's just talking about how great America is again, basically. Like, but it's like, it's baffling because it's like, okay, back up. Because that makes literally no sense based on what we were just talking about. Yeah. That has nothing to do with us talking about our plans. We don't have a thousand tries to do this, you dumbass. <laughs> what is this clue? Why is it two E's? Uh, because 
it was Dutch originally, and that was the original name. It had two E's in it. Okay. I mean, this totally, we, we were making fun of the whole, like, John Lennon thing. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that he lived in the Dakota could have totally been a hidden thing in this. What if the hidden cabal was just him also uncovering the Rosemary's Baby plot, <laughs> which also takes place in the Dakota? Oh, God. Oh, my God. You could do a movie where, like, William Castle was, like, a Freemason truther making the truth about the Freemasons by producing Rosemary's Baby. That'd be a more exciting movie, I think. Here at the wall spelled with two E's. Again. Yeah, do you know that? Because <laughs> New York was over, was originally New Amsterdam. And the Dutch got it by uh, basically like unscrupulous yeah, negotiations with Native Americans. And right. And whatnot. And then the British got it by showing up with ships with guns on it and asking for the colony in a threatening voice. <laughs> so right. that was a good time. The American way. <laughs> That's how we opened up our trade markets with Japan. We'll let someone else buy it. Then we'll just threaten it and get it for free. <laughs> Listen, the money was still paid. We just let someone else buy it for us before we took it at gunpoint. But again, isn't it weird how close this movie seems to get at self-awareness sometimes? Like, are you seriously going to tell me that it's just a coincidence that the the treasure is buried beneath Wall Street? Yeah. And that it's, you know, part of the Wall Street stuff is the fact that we got this island from the Dutch? Uh, yeah. It would have made more sense if you're talking about that reading to talk about, like, a more direct thing where it's like, okay, you can combine Dutch and English people for the most part. White people got it from non-white people and uh, they did so underhandedly. <laughs> but also the fact that like, it, it, in doing so, now that this exists underneath Wall Street, it's like, okay, Wall Street is the new temple of Solomon. Also, how did like, that that is def- very true. You yeah. Right. Um, I was just thinking, like, I haven't questioned this because Ian makes an offhand comment in the beginning. It's just like, oh, I knew to believe you. That's why I didn't think that it was that crazy of an investment. Why is like, why does Ian believe in this so fucking much? Again, we know nothing about him. Yeah. Like after the treasure wasn't on the Charlotte, you think you'd just been like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay. My this advisors is why are right. it makes sense. What you're saying, if you have to have it be as stupid as the antagonist being British, which it should not be. But yeah. if you have to do that, what you're saying makes a lot more sense. I think your idea of having it be like, okay, other people know yeah. and nobody has the full picture entirely, but also Ian has his own angle. Yes. He's also a historian. Just make him more like, yeah, like an estranged member of the like the British royal family or something, like a duke or some shit like that. Make him a uh, like a parallel to to our lead Nicholas Cage, right? And then you have a better idea of what the treasure means to both of them by the comparison. But you have to make them kind of similar first, and you have to make them both interested in it for real character reasons instead of it just being like money, bad guy, bad guy want money, yeah. And I get in, this is a Disney movie made for children just learning about American history, I guess. This was something we talked about, too. Do you feel like this movie would play better if it were just a, like, made-for-TV movie? I don't know. I know it wouldn't be. Then it would be easier to write it off, I guess, just because it'd be like, oh, it's a dumb made-for-TV movie where there's a Because I watch it now, for some reason, I feel like like this has such a made-for-Disney channel, like... I know it's you know it doesn't really look made for Disney Channel at all. Oh, but I mean, like besides some of the helicopter shots of yeah. cities and whatnot, it it could be. It's not like it feels a like something of, that would play on it all the time. Yeah, you know. But then there's no pressure on it to be like better than just what it is. By the way, I just love. Uh, everyone knows that I. Everyone who listens to this show knows that I love when uh, places have 
gigantic underground furnaces for some reason. Um, although I'm a little bit surprised that this church has giant burning furnaces. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> it's like it's the basement of, of that library in Inferno, which is also <laughs> yeah. in New York, so it might as well be the same place. This movie is crossed over with so many different movies. It's really genius when you think about it. <laughs> yes. Benjamin Franklin. And he conspired with Elena Marcos to hide the treasure. And like, you put this with a real person. Oh, Parkington Lane. Yeah. You think that would be like a fake name that they've made? For like, oh, that's the Don't one. make fun of his name. Parkington no. isn't a fake name. No, I'm saying that like you think that they would do that. They wouldn't put it like, I don't know. No, because these people And the are... fact that like in all of the construction of the subways and sewage system of New York City that nobody accidentally ever ran into this fucking underground temple is yes. stupid and there's, dumb. There's that too. Um, but also, uh, I again, you're bringing up the idea of the, the tomb. And again, yeah. I think that relates to the idea of like, what are we doing in this movie? We are surpassing the boundaries set normally by these fetishized objects. Yeah. Um, gravestones. I mean, I understand they perform like a function for people to a certain extent, but really what are they? Does a gravestone exist for any other reason just to be an ornament? Technically speaking. Uh, to, to preserve memory. To Yeah. It has a personal value. Yeah. But also it's like it exists as an ornament basically. And that's not like a judgment thing me saying this by the way us talking about fetishized objects there's all sorts of fetishized objects and it's hard to say like make a judgment value about them only that when you remove something from function i think it it can then lend itself to like propaganda a little bit more easily um but again talking about tombs and mausoleums it it also adheres to the idea of ritual being involved with it as well right so Part of this movie's thing is surpassing the laws normally set by ritual and being like, no, we're going to get involved in history. Yeah. So that, that also would include something like a, a, you know, a tomb, I guess a literal tomb. Have we taught, have talked about how like every shot in this movie for the most part is just like flat and uninteresting. Like the cinematography is very boring. For the yeah, most I part. think it's just really bland. That's part of the, like the TV movie feeling I get of it. I mean, we were never alive during this time, but like TV movies actually used to be kind of interesting at one point. There's some like really neat like TV horror movies from the seventies. It's kind of interesting. I wonder if there's like a good book on just those. But it's like, wow, these got like decent big actors. And they're like pretty interesting movies. And it's like, this was just on TV. Yeah. And now we just, I don't even know. Aliens. Nope, not aliens. Slaves. Oh, we might have oh, to man. reference slaves. Oh, Riley, say something goofy to stop us from thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. By the way, is this a good opportunity just to talk about, I know people like to make just make fun of the History Channel with Ancient Aliens, but is this a good opportunity to just talk about the fact that they play with this fantasy so much as kind of just patronizing and insulting? I guess. It was made with slaves, but, not aliens. But the designs were all the same across the globe. It's almost like that's oh. the best way to stack rocks on top of each other. It's almost like people could figure out math. Yeah. <laughs> uh <laughs> I tell you, I was having a conversation with an acquaintance of mine and she's always been a bit out there, but I hadn't seen her in years, but we were out back and I was talking about politics with somebody and she just comes into the conversation and she's like, so what do you think about Brexit? I'm just like, that's not exactly what you're we talking about, but it's close enough, whatever. So I start talking about that after I say a little about that. She's just like, so you, do you think that there's going to be a one world government? And I'm just like, okay, I can kind of see how we got there from Brexit. It's like European Union and like countries coming together. So I'm just like, yeah, maybe way in the future. Like that, that's a thing. And then you should told her it already exists. It's mm -hmm. called rich people. And then, <laughs> and then that jumps to, so do you think that we've been visited by aliens? So we got from Brexit to aliens in the com like the span of like three sentences. This is like a fun game to play. It's <laughs> like six degrees of separation, but how far is it? Until you get to aliens. Yeah. With these conspiracy people. It's not Kevin Bacon. It's aliens. 
So point to any object and see how many steps it takes for them to get to aliens. Oh, probably not too far. Yeah. With the right people, you could probably get there really quick. Maybe one or two jumps. Speaking of jumps. Yeah. This fun minecart game or and, whatever. Yeah, I was complaining yesterday that like the subway going by was like the catalyst for like everything being shaken, breaking. But like the subway would go by a bajillion times a day. Yeah. I mean, this is nitpicking at this point. But also it's kind of funny that they just didn't build this out of stone. It's like, okay, literally appearance and ornamentation is the entire thing of all of this. And you're telling me they built a rickety ass wooden staircase. Yeah. It's like, no, they would make this shit look as epic as possible because when you find the secret tomb, they're like, isn't this fucking cool <laughs> guys? Yeah. This is like our new clubhouse. Isn't and this also, fucking cool? Also, we were talking about like, they're the masons. Make the stairway out of stone. You fucks. <laughs> like, Maybe so it doesn't break like this, but I guess we were due for an action scene. Otherwise, I would have fallen asleep in this movie by now. Yeah, that's that's why it's like this. Also, it's probably cheaper. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah, I wish. But so this is probably a good opportunity before they fully arrive at the uh, treasure for me to just read some quotes about, again, that idea of aura, which is, this is not directly from Walter Benjamin, but this is from a book called Ways of Seeing by John Berger, which is an awesome book, by the way that everyone should go check out. But he, he doesn't directly reference Walter Benjamin, I don't think, but he, he sort of discusses the same concept on like more, you know, el- like fundamental terms that are very accessible. So I'm just going to read a few paragraphs. He writes, the uniqueness of every painting was once part of it, the uniqueness of the place where it resided. Sometimes the painting was transportable, but it could never be seen in two places at the same time. When the camera reproduces a painting, it destroys the uniqueness of its image. As a result, its meaning changes, or more exactly, its meaning multiplies and fragments into many things. So that's the first part of it, right? What does art what happens to art in the age of its reproduction? Okay, we have made it, we've made multiple copies of it, and the idea of authenticity is less important, right? Yeah. So then that like when that happens, you're in an environment where the idea of authenticity is kind of abstracted and you see it for what it really becomes, which in terms of uh, what Benjamin discusses, he talks about like the idea of ritual art used to perform like a social ritual. And when you take away like the, the value of it being the original, you just see transparently that, Oh, the only thing left to this thing is like it's a historiosity and the fact that it's a ritualized object, but that's it. So it has no use value or its use value is diminished. So it becomes a fetishized object kind of, right? Um, And I'll read this next paragraph too. This new status of the original work is the perfectly rational consequence of the new means of reproduction. But it is at this point that a process of mystification again enters. The meaning of the original work no longer lies in what it uniquely says, but in what it uniquely is. How is its unique existence evaluated and defined in our present culture? Is it defined as an object whose value depends on its rarity? Uh, this value is affirmed, engaged by the price it fetches on the market. But because it is nevertheless a work of art, and art is to be greater than commerce, its market price is said to be a reflection of its spiritual value. Yet the spiritual value of an object, as distinct from a message or an example, can only be explained in terms of magic or religion. And since in modern society neither of these is a living force, the art object the quote-unquote work of art, is enveloped in an atmosphere of entirely bogus religiosity. Works of art are discussed and presented as though they were holy relics, relics which are first and foremost evidence of their own survival. The past in which they originated is studied in order to prove their survival genuine. They are declared art when their line of descent can be certified. So again, every object in this movie treated the exact same way. John Berger is talking about paintings specifically, And you can play that game with the idea of like, okay, you have a real Picasso, but then you have a perfect fake of Picasso. Which one is more valuable? Well, the real one, obviously, but why? Because aesthetically, they're identical. You know, if you had a perfect fake, the real one is still more valuable, even though in a weird sense, it's like, but why? It's only because you know for a fact that 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 Picasso actually, actually touched one, you know? has nothing to do with the the real painting. 
And here's another interesting moment in the movie too, right? Where it does kind of get close to that myth making. And it would be more meaningful if Sean Bean were an American antagonist, because what is John Voight doing right now? He is doing his own myth making to then serve his own purpose. You know, so it's it's like this moment is acknowledging the fact that this myth has a specific goal in mind when it's created and he's adding to it to help deceive the British. And also it is a little bit of like self-fulfilling prophecy uh, in terms of him and what he said earlier about making up the myth of the gold to keep the British preoccupied. Right. Yeah. He does it to Sean Bean later in the movie right there. But again, I think that makes a lot more sense if this movie is better or it means more if this movie is better. Because now, now they're getting involved in that myth-making process and they are like doing it for the same reasons. But again, they have to, not the same reasons, but they're doing the same technique, right, of storytelling and myth-making as a means of trying to not only ensure their survival, but ensure that these resources, this treasure is used responsibly and not just claimed by rich people. Riley, stop talking. Why are you in this movie? I was saying yesterday that when I was a kid, I liked Riley because it's like jokes. But now watching this, I want him to die, maybe? Yeah, he just doesn't belong in this movie. Also, I have one more thing to say from the John Berger book. One last quote. Okay. okay. I'm going to say this. The bogus religiosity which now surrounds original works of art and which is ultimately dependent upon their market value has become the substitute for what paintings lost when the camera made them reproducible. Its function is nostalgic. It is the final empty claim for the continuing values of an oligarchic, undemocratic culture. If the image no longer is no longer unique and exclusive, the art object, the thing, must be made mysteriously so. This entire movie is objects of American iconography being made mysteriously so, the way he describes. We are creating a mystery around these objects. We are creating an aura. We are creating a, a fantasy space that then justifies them by re-imbuing them with like use value and making them interesting again. What do you think about this moment? If the movie was smarter, it would have ended here. Oh, you mean with them not actually finding it? Yeah. I don't know. I guess that would also make it more like... It would make it like silly and sentimental. But right. like the real treasure is the friendship we made along the way. <laughs> Whatever. The real treasure is knowledge and the belief that all men are created equal. Burber-derber-der. Right. But it would make it maybe a little bit even more conservative yeah they go to wall street and they find nothing because of course it's not under there don't look there or it's just like uh the wall street's real wealth is nothing but <laughs> but it's it's interesting because it just hits home how much like his entire identity <laughs> it, it is like orbiting around this mythology that he he's created and more than anything else it's less the treasure he's just he has to validate his own he has to validate his own personality and personhood, right? And that's his real goal. Now, Max. Yes. If you were in this situation. I would die. <laughs> well, okay. How about you, though? Well, I think I'd fare a lot better than that, to be honest. You wouldn't be the henchman who fell into the pit of death? No, I would. That's what I mean when I say I would fare better. Because I would die immediately instead of starving to death. I mean, if I just pressed a thing with hidden switches, I think I'd be hitting everything on the wall to just be like, is this a hidden switch? Yeah. And then how do you reset it after you've hit them all? <laughs> you go. If I learn anything from video games, it's you go outside and go back in the door and the puzzle <laughs> will be reset. Exactly. They just have to walk up the steps a little. Yeah. And then when they come back in, the area will like reload a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be like, okay, we can do this again. <laughs> Does that mean Sean Bean also like responds in the room? <laughs> no. Uh, and you have to tell him the same story over and over again to get him to go to Boston? No, you already passed the speech check. So, <laughs> oh, okay. 
he's really fucking lucky he didn't bend or break that pipe when he jumped off yeah. <laughs> the platform. That it would have been so awkward if he even had it, but he just bent it. That would have been amazing. Who do you think they would eat first? <laughs> the dad. He's the he's the doughiest. John Voigt. He's been old. He's been alive. He's got to live longer than any of them. Yeah, but he's the least like appealing. <laughs> Who would you want to eat? I don't know. Nicholas Cage, Riley. I feel like Nicholas Cage has a lot of drugs in his system, just over yeah, over his life. That's that's the. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know how this has changed your. Yeah, it could. You're, you're like body chemistry, man. Could be some fun, though. <laughs> could have some residual cocaine left over there. Uh, yeah. I think you'd have to kill Riley just because you're like, Listen, I just Riley, don't like you. If I have to die. Because I can get away with it. That's why. Yeah, if I have to die, I'm not going to spend the last two days of my life listening <laughs> to you. Am I going to share my food with you? No. I'll share it with my dad, I guess, and I'll share it with this woman I want to have sex with. But like, <laughs> sorry, buddy. No, I think you'd have to kill Diane Kruger and eat her. How do you know those are scrolls in the Library of Alexandria? Because she's a genius, Max. Do they have them written on there? Just like a library stamp, like property of the Library of Alexandria? Used. (laughs) Yeah. Good thing we have this big Illuminati (laughs) fucking medallion. Thank God for that. No, Max. It's a medallion of our logo. Upside down. This movie is prophetic. Well, no, we made this movie. That's why we're doing it. Oh, my God. We were saving that until the end to reveal. That's the real treasure. It's the knowledge that we made this movie. Why are you guys happy about finding the treasure? Like, I mean, I would be shocked. I'd be shocked and happy, but like, for all you know, you're like, even if you do live, you're still all going to prison forever. Right. But also remember, this is their entire life's work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was saying that like <laughs> it would be the funny self-destruct. <laughs> it was the self-destruct in case like somebody found it. <laughs> it just burns everything. No. Weirdly, this is the same trick. This is a thing that happens in these like tomb raiding movies. There's always some sort of thing they do where they light a light or they like move a mirror yeah. and sunlight gets bounced throughout the entire thing or light lights up the entire thing. But the point of it is always to like find a way to light the entire space and then like get the gold, like ambiance from all the reflected treasure of the light. And also what if there was a cave in and just like all this stuff was destroyed? Yeah. They couldn't perceive subways. Also, when was the last time they stopped adding to this? Oh, whatever. (laughs) Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter anymore. We talked about how this movie could have been more interesting. One thing we didn't mention, though, talking about this scene, right, with this this poor crypt keeper who will be traumatized forever. Every time he orders a pizza, he's going to have an image of Nick Cage kicking down his door and being like, you got a phone? Why? Yeah. But uh, Why is he ordering a pizza? What? He said every time he orders a pizza, he's going to... Yeah, to be delivered. Oh, God. Stop ruining my joke. Jesus. I didn't understand the joke. Moving on, <laughs> we, we didn't mention how um, there's a lot of like retail and blue collar workers in this movie, you know, and they're often there for only like a moment in passing, but one way or another, they somehow like assist or engage with our characters along their journey, which I think is interesting. It's like, it's enough times to be conspicuous. And I thought that was interesting too, but here, he, this is uh, actually a callback to I assume, to Harvey Keitel and Bad Lieutenant. This is that same church where he had his meltdown and then yelled at Jesus. Have you seen that movie? No. It's a really good performance. I've been to this church. It's very nice. Oh, man, that's the other thing. This uh, this movie is a sequel to Bad Lieutenant. Oh, my God. This yeah. movie is so deep, so in-depth. It's too smart for us, honestly. Yeah. I mean, listen, every frame is so dense with different <laughs> references, right? It's and just like the amazing. CGI is about as good as <laughs> the Phantom Menace. <laughs> For that one scene where they show the CGI vault with the declaration. <laughs> it is it is about the same. Be funny if they found a statue of Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> that was the last time they added to it. It was <laughs> 1999. <laughs> this gold statue that George Lucas had made of Jar Jar Binks. Oh man, George Lucas is in charge. 
Is George Lucas part of a cult? Yes or no? Sure. Serious question. No, I don't think so. I think he's just a boring old rich guy at this point. Yeah, he, he's not exciting enough to be part of a cult. Yeah. Except when he says it's a cult, it's a cult he started, and it's basically him and some people on his payroll who are like, okay, George, I'll go to your clubhouse or whatever. Let's imprison this man for a crime he didn't commit. All right, America. No, he committed crimes. He committed crimes, but like they say somebody has to go to prison because the Reasons. declaration was stolen. Yeah. So, But he did trespass a government property, Max. He deserves it. Also, if you're watching this movie, when Sean Bean gets slammed against the car, the like, also the I, SFX is like weirdly loud. He gets like slammed, and it sounds like somebody getting like Mortal Kombat body slammed. And I also joked that like part of his deal with the FBI was that he got to do that. Got it's like one it. of those weird things where it's like the same thing as that editing convention of them having conversations in different locations, and it's like, so wait, did you? stop talking about the thing and then start talking about it again when you were in a different spot, Yeah, you know? And then when he pops out there, it's like, so you went all the way to Boston just to give him a look. But yes, so they, we have succeeded max. They won. Apparently the end goal of all of this was, was just so that they could own a house. They returned it to Cairo, but has anything really changed? I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of appreciate this little bit in the movie where it's just like, oh, they're completely self selfless. They gave it all away. But then it's like the cute little thing. I'm just like, oh, no, they kept some of it. Yeah, except they got that. It allowed them to have a happy ending. Yeah. It doesn't matter how they depict it. It's like, okay, you still took advantage of it then. Yeah. As long as the status quo has been positively affected in a way that seems like tied to the materialism of that treasure, it's kind of like not as okay. They're still capitalizing on it. Also, again, you get that weird shit where he, it like that weird moment where he's like, at least you got the girl. <laughs> I just realized the act like that was probably the actual the actor driving because he like drives over the lawn and then back onto the road. Yeah, I thought that was supposed to be a joke at originally, but it actually could have just been him doing that. And again, we end with a moment again where we. They're going to fuck because they're turned on by American history. Yes, we conflate the American history maps and shit with fucking. Well, <sighs> what a way to end your movie. My movie? Well, why'd you choose this? This is your movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am John Turtletub. Um, but because Nick Cage, but unfortunately in the grand illustrious career of. We could have done Vampire's Kiss. We could have. We could have done Wild at Heart. We could have done Con Air. Um, to be fair, you turned down Con Air. You said that National Treasure was well, more fun Well, here's to do. the thing about Con Air. I didn't feel prepared <laughs> with the schedule this week to dive into really thinking about like the politics of depicting people in prison in the 90s. Yeah. Along with like the whole Supermax like prison policies from the 90s. I get you know, you. like. But I then this about- movie actually turned out to have like stuff to talk about in it. But- yeah. It is kind of a drag for a bit. Maybe I think it should be, be a half hour shorter, honestly. It needs to be, yeah, yeah, definitely shorter. But yeah, do you have any final thoughts on this movie, sir? We hold these truths to be indivisible. Shut up. That Nicolas Cage indivisible. is... Indivisible. Yeah. One nation under God. <laughs> indivisible. <laughs> Listen, we, I'm mixing up my America things. We hold these truths to be invisible. <laughs> that well, There's a map on the back of the Declaration <laughs> of Independence. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, if you want more of our our riotous sense of humor, you can find episodes of this show at spectatorfilmpodcast dot com or on Spotify, iTunes, or Stitcher. And we really should have ended with that stupid joke. <laughs> 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 Goodbye, everybody. 